of the Tacoma Park City Council. Would the clerk please call the roll? Here. Here. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, there are no changes to our agenda this evening. Um, moving forward, um, let's see. Next uh, Wednesday, February 22nd, we are here for our meeting. Uh, public meeting will begin at 730. We have one voting item tentatively scheduled, which is the first reading ordinance approving the extension of pilots. Those are payments in lieu of taxes, um, and we'll be discussing that tonight in our work session. We have three work sessions scheduled for next week. One is discussion of proposal to create a scatter garden. We have the police department's annual report and a pr proposed mutual aid agreement with the city of Laurel. So that is next Wednesday, February 22nd. And then on March 1st, um, we have a closed uh, session to begin at 6 p.m. on legal advice regarding uh, Sanctuary City. We have a public hearing on March 1st um, regarding the city election date change and sharing of polling places with Montgomery County in the 2018 general election. Our voting session on March 1st will include the second re tentatively the second reading ordinance approving the extension of pilots and tentatively a resolution providing for appointments to committees. Our work session on March 1st is a discussion of policies for operating wheelchairs and bicycles on sidewalks. This would be a proposed amendment to our city code. And then on Friday, March 3rd, we have a Ward 3 community co coffee at Capital City Cheesecake um, at 8 o'clock. Um, so I'll join myself and Council Member Qureshi. Um, Council Member Schultz and I had a very good uh, community coffee uh, last Friday at the rec center on New Hampshire Avenue so we hope to see you on March 3rd um, and then on Wednesday March 8th um, here at 730 we have a work session scheduled uh, regarding reviewing New Hampshire Avenue plans and next step on New Hampshire Avenue um, and that's about it for taking us into March um, where we'll soon start our discussions of the budget uh, so uh, now this evening we'll first take uh, public comments on voting items um, our first voting item is a res resolution affirming our FY 2018 council priorities. Um, so if you have any public comments on that, please come to the podium. Yeah. Our next voting item is a sing single reading ordinance for the replacement of a salt dome cover. Public comments on that? Salt dome? Nope. And then we have a single reading ordinance for the resurfacing of a portion of the lower level parking lot at the community center. Any public comments regarding that? No. All right. Um, we also have a consent agenda for uh, appointments to committees this evening. All right. Now we'll take uh, public comments on any items people wish to comment on. Um, Mr. Lovis, we will get you the microphone. Um, for other people, uh, you can come up to the podium. You have three minutes. The 30-second buzzer to I tell you you have 30 seconds left um, we think is working this evening, but just to let you know, we've had some difficulties with it. All right, Mr. Loveless? Yes, my name is Pat Loveless, your official peace delegate. I want to ask you people, uh, if you could uh, somehow, if you, I, I don't know if you do this with schools or not, but you could send out a suggestion on the curriculum about uh, teaching the kids nonviolence from kindergarten on up to uh, college, because I'd like to see the kids have a chance at uh, learning nonviolence. You know, you can you can uh, get information on that at the Washington Peace Center about nonviolence training, because we do that for civil disobedience actions and uh, direct action. And uh, I, you can learn a lifetime. It can change a life. You can teach the kids how not to fight in a playground. You might be able to learn how to deal with the bullies and you'll be able to uh, teach other people at the same time. And I'd like to know if you could ask the school teachers if they'd be willing to do that in Tacoma Park. I would really love to see it in Tacoma Park. is a good place for that to start because I'd like to see them teaching that in the playground and in the uh, school, in the classroom. And also there are several, uh, there are several ways you can do that. You can have them teach the parents how to become nonviolent. 
that they've already got violence in their life, they can they can learn it in the schools and then they can become teachers and teach the parents because there's been many cases throughout the world where adults have taught parents uh, good things where the child has taught the parent. And I'd like to see if you could do that. And also, I'm curious, just out of curious, could you give me an update on what's happening with the Folk Festival? If you've actually had any meetings with the uh, volunteers or anything? Somebody was asking me about that. And I'd love to see it occur again this year because it's going to be so good that people came down from Canada. People came up from Mexico and California to see our folk festival. I've talked to several of them over the years. And even if I can't get to it sometime, I want other people to enjoy something here in Tacoma Park. A lifelong memory is being created there. So I'd like to know if you could do that. And I just want to ask you people if uh, the city council is aware of uh, any nonviolence training going on so I can direct them there here in Tacoma Park. I would really love to see that. And also on the 25th of this month, we're having a demonstration on the healthcare system. Bernie Sanders put it out on MSNBC uh, last night. My nurse told me about it this morning. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to see if you people can uh, come to that demonstration. And remember, leave the violence behind. But tell thank all you. your friends. Thank you. Okay, Mr. thank you very much. And I'm more than happy to follow up with you on a number of items. Just to let you know, the Folk Festival is occurring this year. There are a lot of volunteers. Um, September 10th is the date. Um, and I'm happy to follow you up on a number of other issues with you later. Okay, love it, love it, love it. Any other public comments this evening? Yep. Hi. My name is Katie Staus. Um, thanks for allowing me to comment. Um, my comment is on behalf of Tacoma Park Mobilization. We're an association of neighbors working together to engage our community and take action to support all of our neighbors. We have over 1,600 members now working on a range of issues from environment and healthcare to immigration and civil rights. Tonight, my comment is about protecting our neighbors who are immigrants and who are now being targeted by the Trump administration. Its policies are sowing fear in immigrant communities, including ours, and as federal authorities have begun raids, we're seeing the immediate impact on families. To help fight these policies and protect residents across Maryland, Tacoma Mobilization requests that the City of Tacoma Park support passage of the Maryland Law Enforcement and Governmental Trust Act. We also request that the City provide testimony at the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee hearing um, on the bill coming up this Tuesday, February 21st at 1 p.m. in Annapolis. We've been coordinating our advocacy with the bill's lead sponsors in the Senate and House, Senator Victor Ramirez and Delegates Marise Morales and Carlos Sanchez, and with District 20 Senator Will Smith. The bill is now sponsored by a majority of the Senate, but doesn't yet have majority support in the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, which is why we're focused on testimony there next Tuesday. What will the Maryland Trust Act accomplish if it becomes law? In addition to sending a loud message to all immigrants that they're welcome here, the Trust Act limits state cooperation with federal deportation authorities and protects places like hospitals, churches, and schools from the presence of immigration enforcement. The Trust Act protects confidential personal data of Maryland residents from use in federal immigration enforcement or enforcement of any federal registry based on religion, race, gender, sexual orientation, or national or ethnic origin. And the Trust Act codifies many current practices already in place across Maryland that prohibit local authorities from inquiring about immigration status. Making these practices uniform across the state reduces confusion and fear and extends equal protection to all Marylanders. In addition to our request around the Trust Act, we would like to request approval of community group status for Tacoma Park mobilization. Um, for any who would like to get information or join us, we have a general meeting coming up on Sunday, February 26th. Congressman Jamie Raskin will be speaking, and we've also um, invited Maryland Senators Ben Cardin and Chris Van Hollen. And you can see tpmobilization.org or our Facebook page at Tacoma Park Mobilization for updates. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hello. My name is Anna Olson, and mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant. I just want to say that to also thank my predecessor for her comment. My comment, however, is on a completely unrelated matter. It's regarding the painting of no parking zones on curbs, or the lack thereof, in Tacoma Park. Uh, first of all, as a citizen of Tacoma Park, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to voice my concerns regarding the city's decision to stop painting the curbs. Public Works Director Daryl Braithwaite, who I believe is here today, uh, informed us in July of 2014 that her department had been directed by the city council to stop painting curbs over a year before that. Since then, I've voiced multiple concerns regarding the hazards resulting from leaving the curbs unpainted. Let me explain why. We live on the lower part of Sherman Avenue, right below where it turns into a very steep 18% incline. When cars are parked in the no parking zone, which is the five foot zone immediately next to the driveway apron on either side of our driveway, it creates an immediate and serious hazard for two reasons. First of all, when we back out of our driveway, we have zero visibility of any cars or bicycles coming down the hill. And this lack of vision is exacerbated by the fact that we live on a hill, since you're really trying to see what's above those parked cars from a point well below them. So if you just envision that, I believe actually a neighbor of mine has some images to show how serious this concern is. Um, I'm essentially left having to trust what, that, that anyone coming down the hill will see me in time to stop before they crash into me. Uh, what makes this even more dangerous is the fact that they can't see what's on the other side of the top of the hill until they cross over it and get to the part of this, the, the street where they can see what's below there. And if we're in the middle of the street at that point, I mean, we've been this close to an accident several times. Uh, the second reason is that when parks are parked in the no parking zones, it severely limits the turning radius. It means that you, you have to back straight across the street, often across the sidewalk on the other side. There are children walking up and down these sidewalks to go to school every day around the time I leave for work and come back from work. Um, it's equally dangerous because of the speed at which cars often come down the top of the hill and because they're less likely to see me in time because of the side of cars not having lights or reflectors like the backs do. Uh, so, I find myself in this situation several times every month. I believe painting the no parking zones with fresh, bright yellow paint is likely to re reduce the number of times this occurs significantly, since more drivers will be alerted and reminded that parking is not allowed in these zones. This is still the case. Parking is not allowed in these zones. It's also been brought to my attention, and please correct me if this is not the case, that the reason the city council decided to stop the curb painting in 2013 was because a group of citizens requested they stop doing it for aesthetic reasons. I urge you to think carefully about this and to make the right decision and put your citizen's safety first. I don't care about aesthetics. I, I care about safety. Uh, it's, if, if, if this doesn't happen, it's really only a matter of time before the situation results in a serious accident. And I speak on behalf of many neighbors of mine. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. My name is John Lorenz. I live on 7300 Cedar Avenue uh, in Ward 1. Mayor and Council, I've submitted comments to, uh, to Council by email about the prospect of reinstating yellow curb painting. I wanted to summarize the main points I made in that email. The Streetscape Task Force, which I chaired, addressed a number of concerns in its report to Council in 2015. One was a recommendation that the city discontinue yellow curb painting. Uh, this was not just any group of citizens. This was a duly constituted task force with uh, public input. We studied this issue for uh, over well over a year, and one of our recommendations to the city was to discontinue yellow curb painting, not because it did not attempt to address a real problem with nuisance parking, as you just heard, but because it was the wrong solution. We noted that painting hundreds of sections of residential curbs hazard yellow created a jarring visual effect that was not in keeping with the look or feel of our historic neighborhoods. Hazard yellow may be appropriate for use in warning signs, safety vests, police tape, terrorist warnings, and uh, emergency room uh, driveways, that sort of thing, other institutional settings. But it is visual overkill as parking signage, especially in a town as crunchy as Tacoma Park. While the curb painting program was originally limited to certain areas of the city, it inevitably spread throughout the neighborhoods and into Old Town. As it spread, it created more and more confusion about what constituted a legal parking space. For every section painted, there's an adjacent unpainted section that seems to imply that parking is free there. And this was often not the case. 
The only logical solution to this problem was to paint more and more curbs until the proliferation uh, became uh, something that was really very unattractive and often painted areas where there was no parking problem in the first place. The uh, proliferation is bound to happen again if this program is reinstated and the residential streetscape will be dominated, dominated visually not by trees and gardens and Victorians and bungalows, but by institutional looking hazard paint. The task force recommended that other measures be used to enforce parking restrictions, including issuing tickets, towing, public relations efforts to inform drivers of the parking code, and using white on-road markings to denote legal parking areas. Secondary signs could be added to existing posts that would warn drivers to park five feet away from driveways. Old narrow driveway aprons could be widened. Have any of these things been instituted or even studied since the task force delivered its report? I strongly urge council and city staff to defer to the original recommendation of the task force by insisting that city staff propose other design solutions and by looking at whether our enforcement efforts match the seriousness of the problem. In the end, yellow curbs are just another form of signage. Thank you. And that is a weak deterrent for the problem. Thank you. Hi, my name is Enid Hodes, and I live at 7418 Hancock Avenue, right near Sherman Avenue. I disagree with the prior speaker's um, all everything he said. I I think it's a matter of safety, and I think it's a matter of people being able to get out of their driveways when people are blocking them by parking where you're backing up. Um, they people who park on my street ignore those signs. They do not ignore yellow curbing, and I want to see that reinstated. That we get yellow curbing, uh, the painted yellow curbs again, where parking is not allowed. And I, I totally disagree with the fact that you have to deal with the aesthetics. We're dealing with safety here. There have been many times when I've tried to get out of my um, driveway and people were parked right opposite my driveway and I couldn't get out, like to go to a medical appointment. I had to call the city. They couldn't tow somebody right away and it's just a runaway problem. There's another part of the street on Hancock Avenue near Lee where people park where they should not park. It is posted, but people ignore the signs and it makes for a dangerous situation. So I'm very much in favor of having a reinstatement of having yellow curbing. Hello, I'm Michelle Bailey. I am also on Sherman Avenue. I'm actually Anna's wife. Uh, I would like to strongly uh, just reiterate everything that Anna and other uh, others, the woman just before me who want this, the curbs painted. I, I don't know if it needs to be citywide. I guess that would be my preference because then there would be less confusion. But if, you know, the pros and cons are weighed and a compromise solution is sought, perhaps one, one compromise solution might be to let people who need it for safety reasons and who have requested it uh, by case by case kind of scenario um, on the driveways that need it. Uh, I know that our neighbor Hyattsville, Maryland, has done this. Um, they, the citizens brought this uh, to their council, uh, I think it was uh, uh, December or November of 2015, and they decided case by case, let's get these painted for those that need them for safety reasons. And I think it's worked out great. I actually called uh, the city clerk a couple days ago and she said it's it's been great you know it works for everyone who's concerned about the safety as well as identifying the spaces that are legal because one thing I think is interesting is if you get a ticket you kind of want to know why uh, you'll see on the ticket why you got it but it's also nice to communicate either with signs or painted lines you know I'm open to other ideas but just very clearly mark where the legal spaces are, and I think um, you'll solve all of our concerns about safety and also communicate where the legal parking spaces are uh, 
also maybe you know the newsletters that come out and the public outreach about telling people what the codes are and uh, where the spaces are legal, where it's legal to park. Um, a lot of the park people that park in our our by our driveway have out of state um, license plates, so they're not they're not getting the the memos, they're not getting the newsletters. Um, Lot, there's apartments near where we live, and I think there's a lot of guests and, and people parking there. It's it's a particularly dangerous hill, as was mentioned earlier, uh, and with all the uh, out-of-town parking, there really is a safety concern. And so if, you know, you don't want to paint the entire city, maybe one of the compromises would be, you know, like I said, um, just do a case-by-case. -case. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Fulton. I live at 7315 Piney Branch Road. And um, I want to reiterate what people are saying about the safety issues. Uh, we have a special problem on Piney Branch in that it is a state highway. Um, so I know it's harder for the city to do anything, but we're hoping that the city will um, support efforts to encourage the state to paint the yellow markings. We have... Um, commuters who get there early and they try to put two cars in spaces where really only one car would fit. Most of our neighbors have to back out in the, uh, because they have small driveways and backing out into Piney Branch Road, as you can imagine, is exceedingly difficult in the best of circumstances, but especially during rush hour. Um, and, you know, we've all been taught, I think, that a yellow line means that's not where you go. And when the yellow lines aren't there, people just think, well, I'll just get as far as I can get and squeeze in here so that I've got enough space to get out. And uh, over and over again, you know, I put notes on people's cars and say, please don't park here. It's very dangerous. We can't see to get out. I don't want to have to call the city to ticket. But if you do this again, I will. I feel like it's nice to give people a little bit of warning. But you know, they're commuters who think, well, this is really great because I can park for free and walk to the subway. We had the traffic calming with those, um, the nice streetscapes that we have, and that's very helpful. But there are just a few spaces on either side of each of those, and they become a real hazard if people park too close to our driveways. So please consider uh, backing whatever efforts are needed to encourage the state to deal with Piney Branch Road, which is a major thoroughfare and a real traffic uh, danger for those of us who live on Piney Branch and try to get out. Thank you. Susan Robb, I live on uh, Manor Circle uh, just off of Carroll Avenue. And I, uh, too, um, <laughs> would support uh, at least selected uh, yellow curb paintings. Um, I live right on the corner of Manor Circle, right off of Carroll Avenue. Uh, I've seen a lot of things happen on that corner. I, we have a sign that says no parking from here to the corner. And then we have the remnants of the yellow curb since, I guess, 2014 when it was last painted. It's a little faded, but it's yellow. And uh, I have seen actually two cars parked behind me in that space from here to the corner, which meant that there was one car that was blocking the pedestrian crosswalk across Manor Circle, forcing someone to walk out into Carroll Avenue to get from one point to another. Um, on one occasion, I had someone parked there, and I called it in, and um, the next thing I knew, they were getting ready to tow the car because the car's plate didn't match the car and it was stolen apparently and so they were going to tow the car that was parked in the uh, on the yellow curb and and bottom line is it's not so much a safety issue as it has been described in locations on Piney Branch and Sherman but it's a nuisance factor we're right across from the junction 7300 block of Carroll Avenue. 
We have a lot of commercial traffic parking on our street, and it's just one more intrusion. For example, this evening there is an event at Historic Tacoma across the street, so I walked down to this community center to, uh, to talk about yellow curbs because if I come home, there won't be any place to park when I get a, uh, come home because there's some an event going on at Historic Tacoma tonight. Um, so it's more uh, uh, intrusion and uh, not so much uh, safety, but it is annoying. Thank you. Arthur David Olson, Hancock Avenue, and I'll try to do this in under 30 seconds. <laughs> Tonight the council is discussing a payment in lieu of taxes pilot request. Last year, the council adopted a resolution welcoming Syrian refugees. One thing we've learned in the last year is that landlords are understandably reluctant to rent to jobless refugees. I suggest that one way to make our refugee welcome real is to make renting to at least one refugee family a condition of granting or extending a pilot. Thank you. Any other public comments this evening? No, all right. We'll move on now to uh, council comments. Does any council members have any comments this evening? Mr. Kovar, council member Kovar. Thank you, Mayor. Two quick things. Um, one, and perhaps the city manager and uh, public works can check on this. Um, this is uh, uh, another street related thing, but not specifically the curves, which we'll talk about later, but on Willow Avenue uh, in the 7300 block, there's some issues related to both a speed bump uh, and um, storm drain. And as I understand it, storm drain on one side lacks the metal strip that's there and is crumbling, and on the other side, the metal sticks out. And the speed bump was uh, supposed to have been replaced. So I think it's on the list, if we could just check on that. Um, and the second thing is, um, next week, I'm traveling at the time of the city council member uh, meeting, and I'll be participating telephonically if we can work that out. So, in case people are wondering if they notice I'm not here next week, that's why. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you. First, I would like to let everyone know that on February 20th, uh, District 20 night will be in Annapolis. It will be held at the Montgomery County Delegation Room 170. It begins at 6.30 and goes until 8 p.m. This is a great opportunity to meet uh, your District 20 representatives. For those that don't know, that includes uh, Senator Will Smith, Delegate Sheila Hickson, Delegate David Moon, and Delegate Janelle Wilkinson. Uh, you'll be able to find out what legislation the delegation is presenting at uh, this year's general session. Uh, I'm a member of the Transportation Planning Board at uh, the Council of Governments, and today WMATA uh, gave their FY uh, 2018 proposed operating budget, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One, uh, the system has a budget gap of $290 million. They plan on no general wage increases. They will cut and consolidate up to 200 more positions. They will privatize certain fun functions that includes their parking facilities. They are trying uh, to enhance advertising throughout the system. And there is more fair collection enforcement. So you will see more officers uh, in front of the metro making sure people are not jumping the gates. Uh, one way to close this budget gap is to increase fares. And this is something that uh, WMATA has been, you know, thinking about for a long time. The last fare increase was in 2014. Uh, bus fare, the minimum off-peak increase is proposed to be $0.25. Cents. 
Uh, there were council members there that said that that would disproportionately affect minorities, uh, especially in the District of Columbia. So I think the WMATA's board will uh, look at that, um, especially when you look at the all peak fare increase of the rail system only being 10 cents. So that's a big, big issue for uh, the future of WMATA is one, how do you have a sustained uh, income source? Because right now the uh, federal government does not provide uh, any guaranteed money for the rail system. It's only in grants. And uh, the District of Columbia, Virginia, the state of Virginia, the state of Maryland uh, are the only uh, members of the, what is called the compact that is like their governing body for the system. And those members are the only ones that are putting in money annually to the system. So without dedicated funding, uh, the future of WMATA is, I think, honestly speaking, in question. Um, I would like to remind my colleagues that uh, tomorrow MML is having their chapter meeting. It is uh, going to be at the executive office building. It will begin at 7.30. Uh, the guest speaker will be County Executive Ike Leggett, and this is an opportunity for Mr. Leggett to propose the FY18 budget and see how it will impact municipalities. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Schultz. Thank you. Um, Yesterday, I had the opportunity to get some information uh, about progress, such as it is, on the Purple Line, and I wanted to share that with the uh, community because I think it's uh, useful. Um, a little a moment of history here. The Purple Line was uh, in last year approved by the federal government. Uh, uh, to start construction, and in August, a uh, federal district judge, Leon, uh, uh, took action to block construction of the Purple Line. Uh, and I'm not going to go into what the reasons for that were. I don't, don't want to take the time now, but I'm happy to explain all that to anybody who was curious. Uh, but basically what it did is it vacated the federal government's decision to allow the Purple Line to go ahead, basically saying that the federal government made a mistake. Uh, that sort of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, um, so we've all been concerned that the progress that was supposed, the, the construction that was supposed to have started last summer hasn't started. Uh, here's what's happening in the meantime, is that the, the concessionaire, the, org, the, the group of companies that the state of Maryland selected to build and main, operate and maintain the Purple Line is still on the job. And what they have been doing has been doing uh, surveys. They've been and working with the MTA, the MTA, Maryland Mass uh, Transit Administration has been continuing to acquire uh, a real estate, private real estate uh, for the right-of-way. Uh, they've been doing engineering, final engineering studies, uh, working on various staging for construction. So that, but they have not been able to actually start putting a shovel into the dirt to, be, to begin construction and cannot do that. So, but in any case, what my understanding is, is that the Purple Line is still on schedule. In other words, we really have not lost any time because all this is stuff that would have had to have been done anyway. Um, and the other part of it is, is that the court case may be coming to a conclusion fairly soon because Judge Leone on January 13th told the parties that they would not accept any further uh, discovery or uh, uh, testimony or evidence for further consideration that he was going to take the case under advisement. Uh, that was about 30 days ago, and the chances are, in the opinion of the uh, people that uh, at Purple Line now, and I'll mention what that is in a minute, uh, feel that it's very likely that he will 
uh, make a decision uh, and probably vacate the order uh, perhaps in the next 30 days. And that's, of course, that's purely speculative. Uh, there's no telling, you know, what the federal district judge may do, and I don't mean to imply that anybody knows that. Uh, so that's basically good news. We think that uh, the case has been made that the Purple Line needs to be con needs to be built. I think it's a pretty airtight and obvious case that the federal government has supplied to the federal district judge the, the information that he requested. So that's, uh, that's something that I'm, uh, I'm excited about. One of the things that they said is that so much of the preliminary work has been done is that as soon as the vacate order is uh, uh, restored, uh, that construction will be able to start within eight days. So that's called planning and preparation. Um, I also wanted just to say that we did uh, what a, a mayor, our, our mayor just mentioned a second ago is, is that we did have our community coffee uh, at the rec center last Friday at 8 o'clock. I guess we must have covered at least a dozen different subjects. Uh, I wish there had been a few more people turning out, but the ones who did come and hung in there for, uh, for went through a lot of coffee and donuts uh, had some really good questions, and I was just thrilled to pieces to have a chance to, um, to uh, answer people's questions and to just bat ideas around. It's, it's such an important thing. I, I want to talk, I'm going to be talking to the mayor, she doesn't know this yet, about yeah. <laughs> whether, whether we can change the time of these, of these coffees. Uh, maybe they should be teas instead of coffees, I don't know, in order to okay. figure out a way to boost attendance in Ward 6. But that was a, it was a good thing, and I'm happy to, uh, to have had that event. I'll do tea. You'll do tea. I'll do tea. We did a we did a war three VFW event. Yeah, so. Can we do community beer? Yeah. <laughs> we could do tea. We could have the meeting and then. It's non-alcoholic beer. Councilmember Crush, do you have other comments other than? No, that was okay, all. Okay, that was it. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, I have a few things this evening. One, um, I want to thank Pat Rumba, the play lady, and everyone who helped out on play day on Sunday. Um, yeah, Sunday. Um, it was a great event. Um, I was able to come. It was here. We Our community center was packed with kids playing. Our congressman was here um, playing Simon Says, and it was a, it was a great afternoon. Um, to um, do another plug for our D20 night um, in Annapolis, I also like to announce, I was just told this afternoon, that um, Megan Murphy, um, who is co-owner of Capital City Cheesecake, um, is going to get an award, actually, th um, that evening from our state senator, uh, Will Smith. And I would just like to recognize our police officers, Officer Collington, uh, who's here, and Officer Sims. Actually, Officer Collington um, and also Officer Sims have been doing a lot with our union of the community. and. Particularly, thank you, Captain Collington, for all the work that you've been doing on that. So we are it's going to be recognized in Annapolis on uh, Monday night. Um, the third thing I want to uh, mention is um, there's been a lot of emails regarding um, the hospital um, and a freestanding emergency room. And um, I've answered some of those emails, um, but some of them have been on listservs that I am not on. Um, I want to let folks know that the hospital has hired a consultant who is doing a feasibility study to look at the possibility of a freestanding emergency room on the campus. Um, this is basically the first step, or maybe the second step, since um, freestanding emergency rooms are um, new things. Um, there are two pilots in the state of Maryland. Um, the state has been writing regulations. They are still not final. They're getting close. Um, but before we can talk about a freestanding emergency room on the campus, we have to know, or the hospital has to know, what are the regulations um, and whether or not they meet those. Um, so that's the process that is happening right now. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with um, the president of the hospital um, and the city manager yesterday. They reiterate the, um, he reiterated again um, their desire to look into um, having a freestanding emergency room on the campus, um, and will keep us informed of that. Um, we hope to have more information that we can put on the city website, but I just wanted to let people know that. Um, I'm going to turn over to see Imagine now. No, I need to turn you on. There you go. <laughs> 
a couple things, um, follow up from last council meeting. There was a question, there had been a couple emails about um, parking ticket late fees and, and the fact that uh, we give 15 days before we double the fine. Um, that mimics Montgomery County, um, and that's probably where we got it. Um, one of the things that um, could be considered, as we, especially as we discussed the whole parking plans, um, is, is changing that number of days, and that, that would simply be an action by council. Um, if th there was a calculation that was done by the police department that if um, extending the window before late fee is applied um, by 15 days to 30 days would likely result in an annual loss of revenue about $30,000. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pro or con uh, as part of the discussion. Just want to mention that the um, poem read by the city's poet laureate, Meryl Leffler, at the Sanctuary City Teach-In event called Together We is now on our city mm -hmm. website, and there's also a recording of it there. Uh, as we talked a, a few minutes about police department, um, it, it's nice that they received a high score for the posting on the website of the city police uh, complaint process compliance and our general orders and the police department union regulations and those kinds of things um, that are required by the state. Uh, we were doing it anyway, but it's always nice to get mm -hmm. kudos uh, by the Montgomery County Civil Rights Coalition who noted that it was there and that uh, only Bowie and, and we had it all up um, in the timely fashion. Two identical meetings are coming up about the Tacoma Junction um, design process, and I want to let people know about them. The uh, first set of meetings will look at the topics of form and character um, and talk about market and retail ideas. Those two meetings are on Thursday, February 23rd from 7 to 9 in the community meeting room at the fire station, and Sunday, February 26th, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. here in this building in the Azalea Room. The, there'll be a second set of identical meetings which will look at the public realm, access, and mobility, and those will be held in March, uh, Thursday, March 9th, and Sunday, March 12th. All this information is on the Tacoma Junction section of our website for information, but we, you know, just because we haven't been talking about it in front of the dais that much doesn't mean that uh, there isn't work being done, and it really is a good time for citizens to weigh in on their thoughts about the design and what what the what the um, new project would look like. Susan. Yes. Thank you. Are these meetings ones that have been uh, organized under the uh, aegis mm -hmm. of our citizen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Committee. Okay. Thank you. I assume so, but I just wanted. To right. Sure. No, it's all part of the established process right. for this. Just want to call your attention to the fact that it's time for the Tacoma Park Community Grant Program. Um, the deadline for submission of letters of inquiry is Monday, March 13th, um, but there will be informational sessions about uh, that for prospective applicants. The first will be on Wednesday, February 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m., and the second on Thursday, March 2nd from 7 to 8, both in the hydrangea room at the community center. Again, there's information on the city's website about the community grant program. Um, we've got a special call out from staff that if council members have a specific organization that um, they would like to make sure that we reach out to to see if they want to uh, receive information on this, um, you can let them know about these meetings or you can pass that information mm -hmm. on and we'll send out an email to them uh, to let them know that these uh, informational meetings are taking place. For this grant, I I forget the total amount. One moment. There's different programs, so I, I don't want to say the wrong one. Yes. What was the question? What's the to What's the amount of money that's involved for the community grants program? Um, we're proposing uh, for FY18 that the dollar amount be increased to seventy-five thousand dollars. Right now, it's at sixty. And that's for the total amount, or for it's the total amount of the right. grants. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I'd also, yeah. Uh -huh. 
If we just went back, uh, I wanted to follow up yes. on, on Council Member Schultz's question. So the two meetings that are part of the uh, committee process for Tacoma Junction. Mm -hmm. So can you remind us, uh, to those two meetings and two in March, are there more after that? I mean, I know it's supposed to take a period of a couple of months or? I think that's, uh, again, I'll have Ms. Staines come okay. down and. Okay. I apologize for making no, you walk this, back down. No, this is good exercise. <laughs> It is actually. Yeah. Um, the committee had made a determination that t in an effort to avoid meeting fatigue, if you will, that they would combine the two, um, combine the four topics that they had agreed upon to discuss with the community into two separate sets of meetings. So there'll be just these two sets of meetings that will be hosted. So my only concern is about the lead time because mm -hmm. I don't think I had seen a lot of announcement about the meetings next week previously and I just worry about people having enough time mm -hmm. to you know be able to participate okay. we'll be getting the word out um, I believe Roz is working on that now as well as the folks at NDC but they're also part of this process is an online um, opportunity to comment so that if people have are unable to participate in either their of the meetings they can weigh in um, electronically or if something comes to mind after the meeting is um, they've attended the meeting, they can continue to provide comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know about my colleagues. I just, I just think that two meetings on those topics with only about a week advance notice just doesn't seem sufficient to me. I don't know if others have views on the topic. I guess I'd like to propose that this that this move forward, but I don't have a problem with taking it to say that, that something get repeated. Yeah. Okay. Also, I mean, I'm I, not, I I wouldn't say cancel the meetings yeah. next week at, at all, but I just worry that mm -hmm. um, I mean the whole purpose of this is to really allow for extensive community involvement, and I understand there's been some delays, so it's not a it's not a criticism of that aspect mm -hmm. of it, but I just worry that if we, you know, and, and I'll certainly let folks in my area you know tomorrow but I honestly can see people just not being able to make it next week mm -hmm. right we can bring that to the committee they're the ones that set up the schedule yeah. so we can um, uh, share your concerns okay. with them thank you okay. I would hope that if as a result of these four meetings between uh, between February 23rd and March 12th mm -hmm. uh, that the sense of the of the residents that participate in those meetings is that there's there's they need more opportunity to talk about some of the issues that arise that the that it would that it would be easy enough to continue to schedule meetings uh, on whatever sub subjects need to be further discussed uh, I mean I, I, I again I, I I'm, I'm I agree that yeah, it's good to get these meetings started mm -hmm. and pr pr proceed with them. Uh, uh, and and if if they're successful, in in both from the standpoint of NDC and from the standpoint of co all concerned residents, whoever mm -hmm. they may be, mm -hmm. well then great. But if they're not, I hope that there'll be a sense that well, okay, we'll we'll continue. Mm -hmm. To have more of these, enough, some more. Maybe not. Obviously, these can't go on okay. forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And very I just open, want to say that, the, to that and yeah. and the co-op has um, started through social media and on their website, also publicizing the meetings. So okay. announcements have started to go out. Anything else? I'm um, just noting that the two new capital bike share stations got installed in Ward Six. I didn't, didn't even know. It was today. All of a sudden, it was like, wow, it's today. I'm going to run right out and. Yeah, take some pictures, get some selfies with the bikes. Uh, we're really happy that, they're, that, that they finally uh, did get installed. And, and I think it, it's going to be fun to uh, see what the usage is of that, especially given their adjacency, well, kind of the semi nearness, at least, of one to the transit center. Oh, yeah. our social our mm -hmm. Facebook page now yeah so they were, we're trying to get the word out okay. um, <laughs> Never too 
also encouraging as you talk to your various uh, constituents and businesses, uh, we're uh, going to have our summer youth employment program again. So if you know businesses that would like to participate, we're looking for more businesses or organizations to participate. Yes. going to be a partner this year. Yes. How many students have they committed to? I don't know that. Okay. I don't know that yet. Um, I have a council guidance a question on two items. Um, one has to do with the um, issue of small cell facilities. Um, and this has to do um, coalition of um, Maryland jurisdictions are retaining outside legal counsel to file comments and represent governmental interests in an FCC action regarding small cell facilities. And some of this has been uh, topics of your legislative discussions at different times. Um, the city of Gaithersburg has kind of been taking the lead on this uh, and helping coordinate. They really had gotten slammed with a lot of, uh, of these facilities coming to them uh, to, for installation. There's an interest in having us all kind of partner uh, and share the cost of the legal counsel. Um, we've been asked to join that coalition and contribute $2,000 towards the legal services. The dollar amount was established based on population size. It's something that we can do without resolution or ordinance because of the amount, but given that it's a little bit different than, than the way we usually handle these things, I did want to kind of bring it to the council to see if you support us identifying $2,000 for that purpose. Um, I know that Councilmember Smith knows lots more about it as does um, the deputy city manager, but you know, maybe just be something that a hands show of hands mm -hmm. to move forward. Maybe yep. all that's needed. I don't know what your mm -hmm. thoughts are. Do you want do you want to add more or I was just gonna add that the, the issue isn't so much to, you know, it's the small cell action because I saw my colleagues email earlier, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Schultz and you mentioned that you know we were at the uh, conference, and most municipalities don't have control over it. I think we all understand that, but the problem is that mobility is going to the FCC, and they are f asking for relief when it comes to franchise fees, mm -hmm. and they want that applied to all of these providers, so that we would no longer get any Money. revenue from the franchises. That would include RCN, Verizon, uh, Comcast. So the National League of Cities is really involved in this also because it can be, become a huge issue for cities mm -hmm. across the country. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, sure. all right. Anyone have any other questions on that? So we can just do a show of hands, all those in favor of the city contributing $2,000 towards the legal services, raise your hand. That's everyone. Okay, thank you. Who's here? Um, and then an, another item that I'd like your guidance on uh, does uh, concern the request by the T Tacoma Park Mobilization Group mm -hmm. um, that would like to be considered a um, community, what's the right term? A community, a, a, group. A, a community group. Yeah, well, it is a community group, group, but it's kind of an, <laughs> Officially. An, 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 an approved one f which would have the benefit of uh, using city a city facility rental um, up to 11 times in a year with no charge. Um, in general, organizations um, get that criteria if they submit a list of members and it shows the majority of those members are in Tacoma Park. It's a little, a little more difficult when it's not so much of a membership organization mm -hmm. per se. And so, um, you know, it does seem to be a Tacoma Park centric uh, organization, but it is something that I don't feel comfortable just making that determination. Um, so I would like the council um, consideration of that at least for one year while we see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to say that uh, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Um, no, I think we all know um, the ma the folks who are the main organizers. I think you have now 12 or 16 committees, <laughs> a lot of committees. Uh, and I think believe all the heads of those committees and the groups that are working on them are um, almost all Tacoma Park residents. Um, so um, I would be in favor of uh, the official recognition. Councilmember Siemens, do you have? I just had a question on um, I know that space is getting limited in mm -hmm. the community right. center. 
how does it work? Uh, well, you do you they put bump in a re- people. Do you, they we don't bump it? people. No. We but it but it it does use the space. So it's a first come first serve. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or clarifications? All right. All those in favor, raise your hand. That's everybody. Okay. Thanks here. very much. Thank you. That's all for me. That's all. All right. Any questions for the city manager before we move on to our legislative update? No? All right. I'm going to first turn it over to Council Member Smith to go through um, some things that MML is doing and things in Annapolis, and then I'm going to walk us through some bills that we want to get uh, feedback on. So. Thank you, ma'am. Right. Uh, first thing that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, uh, last week we found out, let me back up and say that the budget comes out every year. It, sometimes comes out through the Senate, sometimes it comes out through the House. This year it's coming out through the House, the House of Appropriations Committee. Uh, we found out the uh, money that is supposed to go to the municipalities for uh, transportation funding was going to be cut by half. So rather than us getting a, a portion of the $21 million, uh, the delegates thought it would, it would be smart, they could save a whole bunch of money, and lock that in half. But what they did not realize is that $21 million included funding for counties and municipalities. So there was a call in action uh, requested by the Maryland Municipal League to send out letters to a number of uh, the members of the House Appropriations Subcommittee that is handling uh, the budget. So uh, city staff sent a letter we were the first ones to respond to this issue. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's MML Legislative Committee meeting, uh, the chair of appropriations, Maggie McIntosh, will be there. And we will make the case that the money should not be cut. So let's talk about some bills. And I will be brief okay, <laughs> because there are a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. All right. And if there's uh, any request for more information, please send an email um, because we do have a limited amount of time and <coughs> the legislative committee talks can go on for hours. So uh, last week's meeting, uh, the bills that we discussed, HB 167, I talked about this last week. Uh, this is um, counties and municipalities at will supervisory employees, residency requirements. Uh, the committee uh, supported with an amendment, and that amendment is that it goes forward, it's prescriptive, so that this will be an option so, for municipalities, is giving so. municipalities more power if they want to use this, but it's not requiring municipalities if you have to use it. Okay, HB 607, Real Property, Vacant and Abandoned Property, Expedited Foreclosure. Uh, in the state of Maryland, foreclosures have been an incredible problem for municipalities. So what we're trying to do by supporting this bill is make it easier for foreclosures to go through the system because most of the time they get stuck at the bank level and nobody knows who actually owns the property and who's responsible for cutting the grass and all that type of stuff. So with this bill, it's trying to expedite the process. Uh, let's see, what else is there? There's a um, HB 767 Public Information Act Inspection of Records from Body-Worn Digital Recording Devices. We supported that. That has been a uh, priority for the league this year. Anything that has to do with body cameras that we will uh, review, the Legislative Committee will review. And uh, we think it's a great idea that municipalities uh, will be able to have the opportunity to inspect the records so that those people that should not be a part of this footage, uh, if a crime has been committed, uh, they can be, you know, blacked out or whatever. Um, let's see here. HB 859, Business Regulation, Traders and Chain 
stores licenses and personal property tax fees and exemptions uh, the committee decided to oppose this bill the part that people don't realize in Maryland is there are a lot of very small municipalities and this has to do with the personal income tax or proper or personal inventory tax and a lot of municipalities are they require they need these taxes traders licenses and uh, these other fees that for Tacoma Park might seem like three hundred eighty thousand dollars that's not a huge amount of money in the big scheme of our budget but for some municipalities that are you know 200 people 2,000 people uh, that's a lot of money and they they just cannot uh, give up um, these type of fees and expenses uh, what hopefully going forward the legislative committee will put together a working group to figure out if there are any alternative uh, means of providing tax revenue to municipalities uh, one area that I think is the best way to go is the sales tax but it is my understanding that the president of uh, the Senate Mike Miller has said that he will die <laughs> before he gives municipalities any sales tax. But we are going to continue to fight. <laughs> Chair, can I? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I just want to say that, that, that for myself anyway, I still want us to try to uh, address in some fashion, not eliminating it, but potentially modifying for smaller businesses here in Tacoma Park, the inventory portion of the personal property right. tax, right. ideally right. in the next few months before you lock it's, in our It's budget. on our so, agenda. We yeah. started the conversation last week, and I just, we have a lot on our agenda, and we yeah, have to I'm get just, through yes. the bills that we're going to take a position on. Um, so I'm just trying to. <laughs> uh, something that I think we're going to talk about later on from the Committee of the Environment, this is SB. 280 non woven disposable, disposable products. Uh, the committee supported this bill just to provide labeling that says do not put wipes in the toilet. That's the basis of the bill. Uh, many municipalities throughout the state thought that was a great idea. Uh, let's see here. Um, I think that was an issue. Many yeah. People, Mayor, I'm going to stop. So <laughs> good, thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate, you. and I have to. And I, I, I know I'm rushing you tonight, and yes. I, I will say again, we thank you very much for spending so much time in Annapolis and on the MML Legislative Committee. You bring back a great deal of knowledge um, to us, and so it's very, very helpful. So thank you. And I know it's a lot of information, yes. and um, we got other things we have to do. Right. And to and we're going to spend some time now. Um, talking about bills that um, we may take a position on um, as a city council on um, Monday evening. Um, myself, Council Member Schultz, and Council Member Smith spent over two hours at least, at least um, going through. Um, there are a couple hundred bills I think we kind of went through. Um, on um, Monday night, um, all of them are available to everyone on council. If you want to um, look at them, uh, we pulled out, um, I think, 11 or 12 bills that we thought uh, we wanted to bring to everyone's attention this evening um, to take uh, to see if we wanted to take a position on it, and then if we want to take a position, whether or not someone wants to go um, testify. In addition, our Committee on the Environment has also been reviewing the bills that are in Annapolis um, and has some suggestions on things that we take uh, a position on. Um, in your blue folder that the uh, city clerk has passed out to you, you have um, two uh, pieces of information. One says state legislation for discussion on February 15th, 2017, and the other is um, Maryland state environmental legislation proposed for 2017 session. We will start with the state legislation for discussion on February 15th, um, that document. 
The first bill is HB 229. Uh, this is the polystyrene ban. We discussed this last week. We need a vote tonight, a hand vote tonight, to say whether or not we would support this without the amendment. Uh, it is the recommendation from our Committee on the Environment that we do support it. So I just ask, unless there's other questions, a show of hands on uh, who would support this without the amendment if it moves forward without the amendment. We the, to the community. Sir. The, the amendment would um, basically be a carve out for local governments who have an existing um, uh, ban for polystyrene. Um, so uh, that would make it so that the state law does not preempt ours. Mm -hmm. So any other questions of whether or not we have support? So we want to go support it first with the amendment, and we said that last week. But if the amendment doesn't go forward, we've been asked to clarify our position. So all those in favor of supporting it if the amendment does not go forward, raise your hand. Okay, that's everyone but Council Member Seaman, so that's five to one on that one. Um, the next one is HB 12. 04 and SB 932. This is a Department of Health and Mental Hygiene bill about an atrazine study. Um, we're at seeing if we are support this. Um, this is a bill that's being put forward by, I think, our state senator, Will Smith. Um, there are a number of residents of Tacoma Park who have been working very hard on this. It has hearings scheduled on March 1st and March 9th. Who's Me? doing the study? Um, don't remember. Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Yeah, I think it's the department. Right. Specifies parameters of the study and requirement of the de Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to report the findings and recommendations to the governor. Okay. I've had a number of conversations with Mike Tabor, who's yes. a local organic farmer here, and uh, I think it's a good idea. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hands of us taking a position and supporting. That is everyone. Um, I'm not sure it's needed to because it, they have they do have a great deal of support on this. But if anyone would like to um, testify on that, the dates are March 1st and March 9th. Just let the city clerk know. Um, next, um, as we already uh, heard tonight, we got a great summary on the Maryland Law Enforcement and Governmental Trust Act. Uh, this is SB 835 and HB 1362. Um, this would prohibit a specified government agent from taking specified actions for immigration enforcement purposes, prohibiting a law enforcement official from stopping, arresting, searching, or detaining an individual, um, and other things there you can read. Does anyone have any questions on this? Council Member Schultz. No, I, it's not oh, me. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, any questions? All those in uh, favor of us taking a position in supporting the Maryland Law Enforcement and Governmental Trust Act, please raise your hand. Do you need to recruit yourself on that one? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm recusing okay. myself. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to ask that yes. before. Apologize. Um, and there are hearings on February 21st and 28th. I had a question for the city clerk. Does it matter, and maybe this is a question for our lobbyists, which day we want to sign up for? Because I think I, I think we would probably like to testify on this one. Yeah, once for the house. Yeah, so. We'll just, we can figure that out later. Um, all right, the next is the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission Membership Act. Um, there are a number of bills in Annapolis regarding the Metro, Metro Rail Safety Commission member. Um, uh, this one we pulled on Monday night because Delegate Corman um, and Senator Feldman are putting this forward to guarantee on the Safety Commission that there is representation from Montgomery and Prince George's County. Um, otherwise, they may be pulling the three members of the Safety Commission from places that actually don't have the Metro in it. And Corman and, and Feldman are Montgomery County yes. officials. So, um, anyone, and the hearing for this is actually tomorrow. Um, any questions on this one? Okay, all those in favor of us taking a position on this one, raise your hand. That is everyone this evening. Um, and since the hearing is tomorrow, if anyone would like to testify, um, we need to know, like, now <laughs> on that one. Um, all right, the next is, um, and there, um, there's another one on sanctuary laws that uh, Councilmember Crushy uh, 
uh, Willie Cruz himself on. This is the counties and municipal corporations sanctuary uh, laws for illegal aliens prohibition. So this would require local governments to fully comply with and support federal immigration laws, prohibiting local governments from restricting specified individuals from requesting, obtaining, sending, receiving, or maintaining specified immigration uh, information. Um, so basically, we would oppose this one. <laughs> you see, they call them illegal aliens. I know, I did. I like, you hear see me choke on it. Um, <laughs> all right, any questions on this one? No, all those in favor of opposing, raise your hand. We have five with one recusal. Um, the next is HB 979, property tax credit for public safety officers. Um, this is authorizing um, uh, a body of the county or municipal corporation to grant by law a specified property tax credit um, for uh, public safety officers. Um, so basically this would be a tax credit for public safety officers living within a county or municipality. That's a good idea. Hmm? We thought we and we thought that when we reviewed these that this fit in with um, our affordable housing initiatives we've been working on. So, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is everyone. Uh, the hearing on this is March t um, March second. If someone would like to testify on that, um, the next one um, is. Um, SB 830, this is another um, Homeland Security bill on correctional facilities. This would require um, a, local, a state or local correctional facility to notify the Department of Homeland Security <coughs> about an individual um, who is subject to an immigration detainer and um, uh, give notice to Homeland Security at least 72 hours before the individual is released from the facility. Um, this was another one we would oppose, given our current uh, stance on. Anyone have any questions on this one? Nope. No. Mm -hmm. All those uh, in favor, all those opposing, <laughs> or all those in favor of us taking, uh, opposing this, raise your hand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. We all of us, uh, five, taking a position of opposition to this one with one recusal. All right, next one, HB 238, Housing Workforce Housing Grant Program Mandatory Funding. This would require the governor to appropriate at least $4 million each fiscal year, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, to workforce housing fund to be restricted to projects in designated suitable communities and adding to the Workforce Housing Grant Program. Um, again, we thought this would fit in with our affordable housing goals. Um, are we a sustainable community? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. You, supposedly, sustainable communities were supposed to get other stuff. But yeah. Delegate Lafferty is trying his best to help us out. And so I think we should send them our support. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's everybody. Um, uh -huh. No, sorry. Did, yeah. Okay, so that's something that we can, can bring back in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a, there's, um, there's a couple of these that I think um, I sent a note to the city clerk that we'd probably need a resolution next week and others that fit within sort of our sanctuary city ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, the next, on your next page, there are three bills. Um, uh, the lead on all three is our delegate, Sheila Hickson. Um, the first deals with uh, Maryland Meals for Achievement in Classroom Breakfast Program. This authorized participating secondary schools to serve breakfast in any part of the school, including from grab and go carts, and clarifying when breakfast in the classroom should be served. Um, again, we thought on Monday night when we were looking through the bills that um, given our council priorities that that's fit within sort of our livable community one that we have been talking about. Yep. Um, any questions on that one? All those in favor please, of, of uh, expressing our support, please raise your hand. That's everybody. Um, the next is Hunger Free Schools Act of 2017. Um, this alters a specified definition for specified fiscal years to determine the number of students used to calculate grants um, for federal programming uh, on this to report to get um, regarding a hunger free schools. Um, all those in favor of supporting this one? Raise your hand. Now everyone. Um, and then the last one here. 
um, is uh, breakfast and lunch programs, is, is repealing the requirement that the State Board of Education adopt and publish standards for the administration of subsidized feeding program, requiring the state to be responsible for the student share of the cost of specified meals, and prohibiting a county board yeah. from charging students that eligible is. for... Hmm? No, sorry. Okay, okay no, sorry. It's kibitzing here on the side. Oh, all right. Um, all right, any questions on this one? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's it. All right. So those were the bills that we looked at. Again, um, all the couple hundred are uh, available um, if people want to review them before next week's meeting and bring any of them to the attention of the council. Um, I do want to also uh, draw attention to um, the Committee on the Environment has brought to us um, a set of, I think, six bills because we already dealt with the polystyrene one that they would like us to take a position on and a number they would like us to track. Um, so I think quickly and people um, trying to look at the city clerk. We should probably go through these tonight too, right? Because some of them are coming up. Um, I did take the last one. Uh, the council did secure all the yard waste and food residuals study. Right. We did that one. All right, so then the first one um, that they have on the list is a prohibition on fracking. Um, this prohibits the exploration or production of natural gas through the process of hydraulic fracking in Maryland. And I just found out the other night that um, um, Montgomery County yeah. actually does have, this could impact um, part of Montgomery County. Um, so. Yeah. Um, Where is and, that? Hmm? There's an area in Montgomery County. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that has Just, natural gas. Yeah. Does this change it from a moratorium to an actual prohibition? That's what this does, yeah. yeah. I don't know if the council wants to take a position on this one uh, at yes. this time. Um, Councilmember Smith would like us to. <laughs> um, any other comments on this or no? All right. All those in favor of us taking a position on the prohibition on fracking, please raise your hand. That's everybody. Um, the next is energy efficiency program, calculation of program savings, and consideration of cost, cost effectiveness. Um, this codifies the continued success of Empower Maryland, the state's signatory um, energy efficiency program. Yeah. All those in favor of supporting, of expressing our support for this one, raise your hand. That's everyone. Okay. The next is about electric vehicles and recharging equipment. This is on rebates and tax credits. Um, this extends the electric vehicle recharging equipment rebate program to 2020 and doubles the amount that may be issued for the program during the fiscal year. And when is it supposed to expire? Is it I don't know, but I'm not okay. going to know that. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a good bill. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. I have a supporting. That's everyone. Clean Cars Act of 2017 extends the electric vehicle recharging equipment rebate for the year 2020. Um, increasing, it sounds like a very similar one to the one above it. Um, it just, just increases the amount required to be transferred, I think, from the Strategic Energy Investment Fund to the Transportation Trust Fund um, for the funds. Um, all those in favor of supporting this one? Please raise your hands. Nope. And the last one from our Committee on the Environment, Keep Antibiotics Effective Act of 2017. This restricts the non-therapeutic use of antibiotics for livestock and closes the FDA loophole that allows antibiotics to be used for disease prevention. This is a uh, leader conservation voter priority bill in Annapolis this year. Um, all those in favor of supporting this one, please raise your hands. And that is it. All right. Um, for those that we need to have a resolution, because there are quite a number of them, we will bring that back next week. Um, so thank you. All right. Those are our legislative items. Now, moving on to our voting session. Our first is a resolution affirming our FY 2018 council. For, oh, I actually have to say thank you to the city clerk very much for organizing um, all, all of, of the this. bills oh, and sure. bringing them to us. Um, it hasn't been a lot this year to go through it. I know, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, it's still a lot. Thank you. Yes. Mm, if I can get to you, yes. Just for the city clerk, I know that you do these minutes. I want to just make sure that it, for the sanctuary city positions that we've taken, it expressly says that I'm recusing and I'm not supporting or yeah. opposing I understand. anything. I've got it all. 
Thank you for the clarification. All right, now, resolution affirming the 2018 council priorities. We discussed these um, last week. Um, I think we had one addition, uh, thanks to council member Kovar. Um, under, we put it under. Responsive, engaged, responsive. This document does not reflect yeah. that oh, okay. yet. Um, this oh. is to affirm. Should I just mention what that was? Then? Mm -hmm. Please do, yep. Um, actually, we went back and forth and Councilmember Schultz, I think in the end, proposed a specific language, so I can leave it. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. I, can, uh, I have it right here. The idea was an engaged response to government under ongoing activities, just to add in there, continue liaison efforts to ameliorate land use conflicts between adjacent business and residences. And basically the idea behind that is just that there are ongoing efforts in the specific spots, which are just about in every ward. I'm familiar with the ones in, in Ward 1, where residents live in areas that are about commercial areas, some of the issues that arise around that that uh, we need to continue to focus on addressing in a collaborative way, we hope. And I think that's a priority. Great. All right. Uh, can I ask for someone to move the resolution affirming the 2017 council priorities? Yes. I'll, I'll council Member it. Schultz will move. Do I have a second? Second. Council Member Qureshi, second. Any other questions or comments on this? No? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, I passed. Uh, next, single reading ordinance authorizing contract for replacement of salt dome cover. Uh, huh. Let's see if anyone would like to move this. Uh, Council Member Kovar will move a second. Second. Council Member Smith, any questions or comments on the contract for replacement of the salt dome cover? I would think we haven't used much salt this year. I don't think so. We got to cover it. We got to cover it up so we can save it for next year. year. That's right. <laughs> All right. This is a single reading ordinance. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilmember Kovar. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Stevens. Aye. Councilmember Schultz. Aye. Councilmember Qureshi. Aye. Mayor Stewart. Yes. All right, the next is a single reading ordinance for resurfing a portion of the lower level parking lot at the community center. And I actually had a question for our head of public works on this. Um, and I did as well. You, and Council Member Kovar does as well. Do you want to just give us a quick recap of what this one is? So. Sure. If you haven't been down to the lower level parking lot uh, lately, uh, if you take a, take a trip down there, it's in pretty deteriorated condition. Um, we were aware of the defective concrete pretty early on. Um, some measures were taken uh, immediately after construction related to the original contractor, but the quality is, is clearly uh, less than. Um, <clears throat> we've taken a look at a variety of ways to deal with it. I mean, one idea is you literally chisel away uh, several inches of the top and re-pour. It's a very expensive process, would take a long time and would be incredibly, uh, have a negative impact to the operations of the facility. Uh, in its current state, it's still in a in, um, less deteriorated state so that we can resurface it. Um, and we've taken a look at everything. We're putting a layer of asphalt on top to what we're proposing, which is a kind of a vinyl uh, a vinyl adhesive layer that comes in multiple, uh, multiple levels. Um, we um, explored uh, the options, called a lot of companies, had a few out. Only one provided a bid, uh, and that's the bid we have before you this evening. Uh, that price is to just do the lower level parking lot. Um, we did have a sample application done on a six foot square section in one of the parking spaces and we're pretty pleased with the way it turned out and we got to watch the full process from beginning to end. Uh, so we're quite confident that this will provide um, a waterproof layer and a, a longevity to the concrete um, parking pad uh, so that it can continue to be used without deterioration. <coughs> Once this layer is on, it can get resurfaced. You resurface the, the top coat every few years, so it's something that with maintenance can, you know, can stay intact. Um, so I think the question I had, um, you're proposing here that the project is split over uh, this year and then next uh, fiscal year um, and do it in two phases. And I guess the question I had was, um, should we entertain the idea of trying to do it? Uh, is there any cost savings in doing it? in this year and how we were looking at our uh, capital improvement budget. 
Yeah, that would be uh, an option. I'm sure the contractor would prefer to do it all at once, though we still would have to phase it in the in the installation because it's a fairly large area that we're that we're working on. Uh, we cut it into two sections just for the purpose of the funding. We had sixty five thousand identified in the capital budget this year, and um, half that cost would be slightly more. Mm -hmm. from, from my perspective. Oops, sorry. Yeah. I need to I'm not, oh, I have to turn some, sorry. My perspective, it, yeah, there we go. Um, it, it doesn't matter either way. Um, we, we could swallow the cost this year and, and do a budget amendment. And um, I, it's, it is a large area, and I'm, I'm not sure if it makes sense to do it all at once. But I, it's kind of a flip of the coin and timing is, so I, I defer to, Ms. Mm -hmm. Braithwaite on yeah. splitting it into two years, but it's not, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference to me, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I could, I could argue at either side. Mm -hmm. Council Member Kovar, did you? Well, that was the same, that was the same question I was going to ask, and I guess the question is just if we have the money this year, or if we could, and it would actually cost more next year, which I thought is what it said. It would, would cost a little bit more. Yeah, we haven't, uh, of course, we, we can't get a, um, um, absolute price from the contractor depends on any number of conditions there will be obviously an increase uh, you know six to eight months later but um, yeah it'll be some percentage more mm -hmm. and is there any um, and sorry if you just said this but is, the, is there any reason is there any um, reason to split it is it easier on the staff is it easier on uh, just for um, just for managing uh, a, t a space that they can do um, in one time, they will probably cut, they probably would have split it into separate sections um, concurrently. We're trying to do as you know as little impact on the police department parking. Uh, they won't be able to have access to the parking lot while this operation is is going on. Um, so um, we were assuming we'd do one side, they could park in the other, but then in order to do that front side, you couldn't park behind it. So mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a a wash either way. Um, there'll be no no ability to access the parking lot while the process is taking place. I guess given the the mixed feelings on this, um, you could go ahead and approve it, but if we found that we could get significant cost savings by doing it all at once, we could come back to you and ask to, mm -hmm. to redo that. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be. Okay. Councilman Schultz, did you have another? I was just gonna say, we could leave it to your discretion you two to make that decision based on your conversations with the contractor and, mm -hmm. and maybe when you get into the project you'll find that oh let's just keep doing this I mean and just to give you the flexibility mm -hmm. the discretion okay. does I, that I actually feel better okay if you, uh, with this kind of number the right. size of a project I prefer to to have it closer to the number that we actually spend mm -hmm. okay so would you you would like us to change then the um, it to say? I think that I think I'd prefer that you you go ahead and approve this, and then you come back. But, to us but is if what you we said. find yeah. out that it makes a lot more sense to do a different way, we come back to you and ask right. for a replacement yeah. ordinance. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that makes sense. All right, would someone like to move the ordinance? Councilmember Schultz, a second. <laughs> Councilmember Koreshi, second. It's a single reading ordinance. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Kovar? Yes. Councilmember Mayo? Councilmember Koreshi? Aye. Councilmember Seaman? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Schultz? Here. Mayor Stewart? Yes. I'm in. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, all right, next we have a consent agenda um, with our uh, appointments to the Arts and Humanities uh, Commission and appointment to the Committee on the Environment. Would someone like to move the consent agenda? Councilmember Smith, um, someone second? second? All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 All right, next we have our first work session, Montgomery Housing Partnership request for an extension of their pilot payment in lieu of taxes. Good evening. Um, as noted in the cover memo, the council is being asked to consider a request submitted by Montgomery Housing Partnership for an extension of three existing pilot agreements on properties that they own in Tacoma Park. Uh, two are in Councilmember Smith's ward, one on Flower Avenue and on Houston Court. The third is on University Boulevard in Ward 
six of uh, uh, Council Member Schultz's. Uh, the existing pilots were approved in 2006 and were for a 10 year period with the abatement um, graduated over a period of time with the understanding that half of the units would be made available to individuals at 80% of the AMI. The request is to continue the existing pilots at a 50% abatement period or exemption period for a period of 10 years, again with the same um, set aside for affordable housing units. Um, Mr. James Miller, who is an asset manager with MHP, is here with me this evening. If you have any questions, he might be able to answer them. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Council Member Siemens? We'll try this. Okay. <laughs> Losing my voice slowly here. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, during the public comment session, we had a suggestion that uh, we ask for uh, housing for uh, Syrian refugees that are moving to Tacoma Park mm -hmm. and that uh, we uh, provide uh, housing for uh, one Syrian family for a period of time, unspecified period of time. I just wondered if that's a possibility. Uh, we support, we support that, MHP definitely supports that. That's a short answer. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, apartments that uh, we call market rate apartments and they're really, uh, we call them that because they're not subject to any uh, compliance through housing programs mm -hmm. uh, like uh, tax credit or home or any, any program like that. Uh, we have been approached uh, by a uh, church group and we've, uh, and there are organizations that uh, approach us that say uh, we will bring the immigrant family in, we will be the leaseholder, and we will pay the rent until they get employment, until they get established, and then they will be able to qualify on their own. And we can do that on properties where we control the compliance on, or on property, or units where we control the compliance on. Uh, there are some issues with tax credit. For example, we can't have the lease in the name of the church and then have somebody else be in there as, as a tenant. And, you know, they have to qualify mm -hmm. uh, both income and em employment-wise. That could develop into that at some point in time where they could move into a tax credit unit once they uh, become a, a established. But for the apartments that when, as we have them available in the market rate, for example, there are eight of these 75 units, there are eight that are market rate. Uh, they're currently, I believe they're currently all occupied, but if they come vacant, absolutely, we would support that. Okay, so I can suggest that Arthur Daniel Olson, who was the person at the public comments, can talk with a MHP and see yes. what arrangements can be made. See, see what we, we can do. I mean, to the extent that we can, we will. Okay, thank you. Okay. Council Member Smith. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate you guys being here today. Uh, I've been a long supporter of MHP and what you guys do. What improvements, if the council does go ahead and uh, Approves this, these pilots. What improvements are you actually going to do to the property for the tenants? Is there anything uh, scheduled to happen in the next few years? Well, you know, initially we renovated the, the properties. We renovated all three of these these properties, and, and basically our request is so that we uh, are able to afford to maintain the, the rents low and that we're able to provide services, resident services, uh, quality services, and provide good good maintenance. Uh, coming in 2017, we have to start paying the acquisition loan back to the county. It's a considerable amount of money. And so uh, without, the, without the pilot, it significantly limits what we have in case we have uh, certain unexpected, ex unexpected expenses uh, and things that may happen on, on the property, which do from time to time 
we need to have enough money that if there is something, we have a little cushion. I mean, other than our reserves, some things you can use out of your reserves, and we try to build our reserves uh, so that we have things for when the roof needs to be replaced, the large capital items. But there are some, sometimes there are small items that you have to take care of. Uh, we had one on one of the properties where we had a specific moisture problem, and we spent uh, between ten and fifteen thousand dollars on one apartment over a period of one month just to solve that problem, and we did solve that problem. So we need some kind of an amount there as a cushion to to be able to help us deal with these unexpected issues that happen on all apartment communities. And you said that you recently renovated these properties. Are they energy efficient? Are they rated energy efficient? Are they the are appliances energy efficient? They are about as energy efficient as you can make a building of that. Of, at the time when we renovated it, I believe that was 2006 that we renovated these, and we took into consideration <coughs> uh, all energy efficient tactics that we could at that time. Uh, uh, we have uh, since looked into other methods for energy efficiency. Uh, it all depends on what you can do with the structure of the building, you know. Uh, what you can do, uh, you know, we look at, we look through at PEPCO for PEPCO and rebates and their, their programs, and we do whatever we can. Do the, pen ten the, penance, do the tenants pay utilities separately? Uh, yes, they do pay utilities separately. Okay. And the rental rates, what is the annual increase on average that you guys have? Whatever the county guideline may okay. be. Uh, right. This year, I, I believe it just came out at 1.6. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and finally, are there community rooms at the, what is it, the Houston property? Houston Avenue property, does it have a community room? No, we don't have community rooms, but we share, uh, we have, they can go to the Gilbert, Gilbert Highlands, right. uh, and uh, we provide, we provide some for the children there. We have uh, children programs and after school programs and uh, for the little children. And is the reason that you don't have one at that property, is it a space limitation? Yes, there, okay. there's space, space limitation there boiler rooms that we can't really do anything with and things okay. of that nature. Thank you. Welcome. Councilmember Kovar. Thanks. I just want to uh, associate myself with uh, Mr. Rolson's comments and Mr. Siemens' comments about the refugees and appreciate your commitment to try yes. to address that. Thanks. Okay. okay. And we really do uh, appreciate the council's uh, support of our affordable uh, housing uh, initiatives in, in this area. In, the, in Tacoma Park, both in creating and preserving affordable housing. So we appreciate your support very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions from my colleagues? No, I think that's Thank it. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you so much for staying tonight. Thank you. All right. This will come back to us then next week uh, for first reading. Uh, next, we have our discussion of policy and standards for painting of curbs. Who wants the to go item first? item you've been waiting yes. for. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, we do have Ms. Braithwaite here um, as well um, to answer any questions. But essentially, um, in 2013, there was, as I kind of put it, a, a fairly strong head nod uh, mm -hmm. giving direction to me that basically, unless there was a um, s significant safety issue at a particular location, that we would no longer do yellow curb painting. And um, we can do it either way. We can either paint the curbs or not. I think there's a couple issues about painting curbs. One is, takes a lot of paint, a lot of manpower, um, and the proper way to do it is to, if you have paint, after a certain period of time, you need to strip the paint and then repaint it so that it actually adheres to the new paint. And, and so it's, it has a, there is a process for that. 
a number of the places where people want yellow curbs painted wouldn't fit the criteria for painting. Um, these are, there's a, one person who doesn't want people to park across the street from her driveway so that she has more room to get out. Um, there's others that, um, and I think that there is, you know, a real issue about people that park really close to driveways, and it is intimidating often trying to back out of a driveway when the cars are right there. Uh, and, um, you know, we certainly can, can do that. Um, we did have the streetscape task force that felt very strongly that that wasn't an attractive thing to have across the city. Um, I think there's merit to the criticism that if you put it some places, but you know, but don't put it other places, it adds confusion about, well, if you don't see yellow, maybe you can park really close to somebody's driveway. Um, and there is the issue that's been raised um, about some people are more likely to call to request curb painting than others if you did it on an as on an as demand basis. We've got information here in the cover sheet about um, you know these points. We can, um, if you decide that you want yellow painting back, that we can um, put the money in the budget, and then it would be something that we would do. So it's kind of. Do you want it? Do you, do you not want it? And how do you want to address this question? So I have a question first. Um, in looking at you know the way we deal with um, some other issues, like when we have uh, traffic calming, um, mm -hmm. and I think from listening to residents, we're we're in this sort of limbo place um, right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the it's unclear of how we approach this, um, and I. You know, I understand that it was. We'll blame prior councils because <laughs> we're not it. <laughs> um, but you know, those things happen um, sometimes. I guess the question I have is: Is it would it make sense? And I'm ask for Miss uh, Braithwaite's uh, uh, input on this. If we if we followed a process like we do with traffic calming, mm -hmm. where it's clearly laid out um, that people have to, you know, get to with their neighbors. They have, we have, there has to be criteria they need to meet, um, and then it comes before the city council. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't want to be spending a lot of city council time debating <laughs> um, curb paint, but I'm just wondering if there is a way of setting up a process. Um, by which it's clearer to people and there, there is input um, and, and you, criteria you, for public safety. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly can do that. Um, I think the, the issue really is the request basis of that mm -hmm. and that that, that can have a, a racial disparity. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one area where I know that some yellow paint is actually painted it's not by us, but it's by an apartment building that likes having the yellow paint mm -hmm. near their driveway. Um, and so we haven't come down on them for painting public property, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we could. Um, but there really is, an, there, I think there really would be a disparate outcome mm -hmm. if, it, if it were done on a request basis, whether it's an individual request or a street by street request. A process certainly could be done. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's simply a work you know, it, it would have a work impact. And do we have, and I know um, you may not have this, but if we did go to um, allowing more of the uh, curb painting again, mm -hmm. what kind of budget um, impact we're talking about? In the overall scheme of things, money-wise, fairly fairly low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a five-gallon bucket of paint. Mm -hmm. um, purchased a few times a year um it's the work staff place. hours yeah, yeah it's a little more impactful um in in sitting and listening to the conversation today um you know we didn't really have an opinion one way or the other we get calls and have heard um and understand the, the positions on both sides 
one of the things that's clear to me on, on the curb painting is it, it does deteriorate fairly quickly and it does look pretty ugly mm -hmm. um, fairly quickly. Um, one, uh, one avenue that I've heard raised that uh, we may want to explore as a trial basis is to do a, uh, a white thermo line on the street versus painting on the curb. Uh, so mm -hmm. that you could use that on either side of a drive where you were, you'd have a line on the street, you know, at the curb side, um, mm -hmm. perpendicular to the curb that would denote, don't clear, don't park in front of the driveway. Um, whether that would, whether that would communicate clearly enough, uh, to people, I don't know, but it, it would certainly be easier to apply. Um, I think it would not, because we'd use thermoplastic, it wouldn't flake and chip and peel the way paint will on concrete, um, and it lasts a lot longer. So that might be an option we'd want to explore, um, maybe with some folks that have some really present issues with uh, people blocking or, you know, get parking too close to their driveway. We could attempt it and see if it, see if it uh, is relevant, see if people stay away from the driveway apron as a result of that or not. Um, so that you know, I think that that is the driveway aprons are where we mm -hmm. get the most um, complaint. The the and I actually don't mind the painting on the street. Um, the one of the things though is that once you start identifying parking spaces, <coughs> so if you were to actually kind of, you know, every twenty yeah, feet or whatever, um, then we have to tabulate the and identify a certain number of handicapped spaces mm -hmm. uh, based on that proportion. And so it, you don't have to do it if it's just kind of open. Uh, the more that there's identified spaces you do, and depending on the street where there's a lot of driveway aprons, you, you'd end up with that. It's not a bad thing, it's just something, it's just a fact that we have mm -hmm. to um, build in. And, and then when you're looking at handicapped spaces on the streets, you normally choose the space closest to a corner mm -hmm. as the handicapped space because that's closest to a curb ramp right. on, a, on a crosswalk, which would sometimes make the people who live right in front of that space angry. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. Yeah. I, I wasn't following your recommendation. <laughs> a line going from the curb into the street is what mm -hmm. you're saying? Yeah, uh, yeah on, just on kind the street. of a... If I had a piece of paper, I'd draw it. As the driveway apron comes out, now we paint the curb yellow on either right. side. If instead, at the edge of where that curb painting would stop, we, we painted a horizontal line on the street, you know, six feet or seven feet, the width of a car. So what did it used to be? Was it six or seven feet? The, yeah, the, I think the it's The painting, five feet. we do four feet on either side. Mm -hmm. And um, what about if I park near a stop sign? What are the rules? How close 25 feet from a, a stop sign. And then the fire hydrant, 15? Uh, fire hydrant, I think it's 20 on either side. It's a quiz. <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because it seems to me that... I think she wins a prize. Uh -huh. Yeah. It seems to me that residents, when they park on a street, know that they're too close to a stop sign or know that mm -hmm. they're too yeah. close to uh, a fire hydrant, and by behavior, they park farther away. Uh -huh. Now, it, it appears to me we also don't have codified in our laws that if you park too close to an apron of a driveway that you can be ticketed. Is that fair to say? We like do. It is. Yeah, yeah, it, it, is. Is. it is. It is. It's, it's, it says six yeah. feet? I think yeah, well, four feet from a driveway, driveway apron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why we tell people they can call the police oh. department and they'll give them a parking ticket. Right. So, I mean, just so I, I mean, from my perspective, and I can understand both sides of the issue as well, a lot of the people that came in here were the ones who raised with me, particularly our chairman, which I've raised uh -huh. with both yeah. Miss Ludlow and Miss oh. Braithwaite. Uh -huh. I mean, I've gone out there, I've taken pictures, I've seen it. To me, there is a public safety concern when those cars are parked very close to their driveways, uh -huh. and you have streets like Sherman that have a deep, uh -huh. steep incline, especially right. when you look at winter weathers and things like that. Uh -huh. um, but I also understand the, the, the problem, potentially, of having misapplication or sort of confusion in the community if you're doing it in certain places mm -hmm. and not others. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you know, <coughs> we already have narrow streets in this community. Um, there's limited space to move around. Um, and then on top of that, I think nothing maybe frustrates your quiet enjoyment of your property more than when you're coming home or you're leaving home 
and there's somebody blocking your driveway because, oh, yeah. I mean, there is that frustration that people uh -huh. in the community have. Uh -huh. um, to me, the, the streetscape argument, frankly, is not compelling. Um, uh, there's a lot of other things like huge McMansions in our community that I think aren't make, don't make our community beautiful. I think that if, if it's a legitimate public safety concern and people have raised it, um, I think it's not too much to ask for if there is a request. Um, because I don't feel like they, people in the community who have been in touch with me feel like they're getting the re level of response from whoever the enforcement officer is who could ticket or tow these vehicles such that they're not experiencing that public safety. So either way, it's going to increase the workload on the city staff. From my perspective, if you go ahead and paint those lines at the request of neighbors and residents, um, then at, 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 at first blush, it's less actual hours in the long term because presumably it'll dictate behavior and people will not park there. So I, and I'm not going to say, you, you go down Sherman Avenue, there's a division in how people look at this issue. Um, but there are many people, and I'm not talking about people who've also emailed me, I think, on Sherman Avenue about, well, parking across the street from your driveway. I think there's a, there's, that's a different issue. To me, it's along aprons of driveways where you have narrow, steep, inclined streets. I think we're looking at a real public safety issue, and I think the council and my colleagues should consider going back to painting the curbs. And there are people in the community, we've received a number of, um, of comments about, well, do a pilot program, Ch try a couple streets and see if you see mm -hmm. behavioral differences. Um, but I think it's, it's a potential step in a direction where I, I've just received a lot of communications from community members, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Cresci, just to clarify, would you be supportive of this idea of painting the lines versus the curb? To me, uh, it doesn't make a difference, uh, frankly. I mean, mm -hmm. I well, think I think it makes a difference. I guess what I'm hearing is though it does make a difference in terms of, of upkeep. Um, and upkeep. And no, no, I get that. What is, I mean yeah. is it doesn't make a difference to me so long as it dictates proper behavior. Okay. Um, but you know, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I pulled into a spot and I didn't see a yellow line going to the apron, if I would look at a white line just going on the road, be like, somebody must have just been playing around with spray paint. <laughs> I'm just going to park here anyways. Uh -huh. yeah. If it's going to continue to create the same problem, it may be require some kind of analysis or study on, uh -huh. I don't, not to create more work for you, Ms. Uh -huh. Braithwaite, but uh -huh. it may be worth looking into. I mean, if you're going to get the same complaints you're getting now by painting a line into the street, then maybe it's not worth it. Uh -huh. but. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate you being here, Ms. Braithwood. I thought we were done with painting the curb. Uh, I haven't really gotten many questions about this. Uh, has Do you have any data from the police department that says how many tickets they've given out or oh, they've left um, i'm not aware of it <laughs> towing they, or... they may be able to we, they may be able yeah. to pull that up okay I mean, I, um, I, I mean i'm sure they probably can <clears throat> that would be helpful yeah. the white line idea where else in the region are they doing that because i have never seen that well i've seen um mm -hmm. i've seen parking spaces marked on a street either with a uh, little t's or, or yeah, the, the or corner ninety degree angle. Okay. Um, that that to me the corner does a better symbol of that because then you kind of see oh yeah and that's that's identifying a parking space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maintenance, because that was one thing that we talked about mm -hmm. when we had this mm -hmm. conversation before, I guess two years ago or whatever the time period was. Has that changed? You know, are you guys are going to go and if if we change the policy, you'll go and paint all these curbs. But then you, you, you have to remind me, you repaint them every year or every oh, two years? Oh, multiple times, depending on the situation, yeah. And yeah. so that was the issue back then. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed. It's still going to... Well, we haven't done any, any painting for a, a while, uh, with, with few exceptions, mostly around Holly Avenue and the school zone and then uh, fire hydrants. But, but, yeah. but I guess my point is your workload load hasn't changed. You know, what you guys are doing now, if you add this on, 
then you got to figure out some areas that you're going to have to yeah it's just it's a matter of um you know it'll take us a little longer to get things i mean we'll still do what we do um just you you know there may be a little delay do you foresee if we move in this direction another fte no the thing that i i mentioned here is that if we were doing this on a on a fairly large scale basis we'd probably contract for it okay okay all right i mean the number of requests we get are fairly small i mean for the driveway apron um at least my memory um but if we were going to do it on a consistent basis or we we're going to have a whole area where we're doing it mm -hmm. we would need to make a different kind of arrangement for that okay and so if it tends to be very uh, personal yes. so i i don't see it lending itself well to the traffic calming process just because you know if you don't have a driveway you don't care if you've got a small car you don't care <laughs> older people have more difficulty than younger people navigating driveways so you know it just it tends to be kind of individualized one concern i have is the streetscape of the future flower avenue mm -hmm. green street yeah, how do you foresee working with that area? Well, a lot of the intersections, we have bump outs. Um, so we've already taken care of the issue of people parking too close to the corner. You just won't be able to do so. Right, but if, mm -hmm. if we change the policy and say that you can have this y the yellow paint and residents start demanding yellow paint, we're going to go and paint, right? Uh, yeah, I would think that if we change the policy, then it's a, it would be a request-based um, situation if someone wanted the yellow curb on either side of their driveway painting right. they would call us we put it on a list and and do it all right thank you okay. councilmember Kovar. thank you appreciate it um, this is one of those issues where I think it's possible to have two what seem to be sort of conflicting ideas both of which have some appeal um, not in the way Donald Trump has conflicting ideas that are actually in conflict with each other. Um, there were a number of witnesses here tonight from Ward 1, and uh, just so folks are interested, I reached out both to the proponents of keeping it the same and the proponents of changing it. One um, resident, Mary Deru, and I thought I had circulated her email to the um, uh, city clerk, and apparently that one didn't go through, and my phone has now died. So, But she was an early advocate of of this and pointing out the dangers to me and so she actually asked me to come visit her and I parked in her driveway at around 530 on Piney Branch Road and I understand it's a state highway I might have mentioned this before and you couldn't back out of her driveway at rush hour without really risking something and there are other places like I live on Holly Avenue it's not really it's not really an issue and people seem to respect the uh, the parking in terms of being close to people's driveways part of the problem in Piney Branch is it's a non-permit uh, area. Mm -hmm. As someone else mentioned, people come from all over, not just from Tacoma Park. So even if we put something in the newsletter, they never know. And you go there early and you're parking to ride the Metro. And so um, that, I think, is the challenge there. For me, it's not either leave it alone and put people in a dangerous situation or cover the entire city with the yellow paint. Uh, that is just a false choice in my opinion i think the answer is if there are dangerous situations and i agree the the white paint on the street is a much better thing i do think the yellow paint is unsightly and, pro and not in keeping with uh at least maybe in some of the historic areas what we want and it sounds like it doesn't last as long and isn't very practical and i think most people are accustomed to seeing white marks on, on the street when you park in a parking space. We have those right on Carroll Avenue, for example. I don't think you have to mark it out all the way so you necessarily get to the disabled parking. You just have to put the uh, markers near people's driveways. And what people have told me is that when they call the police, first of all, you're leaving for work in the morning. Mm -hmm. You're not going to suddenly stop and call and do all that. But if you do, and they come out, and it's not a mark, it's kind of like, OK, well, it's not really a mark. Maybe they're there, maybe they're not, and they don't get a ticket. So to not have some way of indicating it where there's safety concerns, I think that's the issue. But I think we can, I don't buy the argument that if you put it in some place, then you have to put it in every other place. I think people can read the signs, and if they don't, if they don't abide by the signs, then they get a parking ticket. It's, it's as simple as that. But on a long stretch along, again, Piney Branch being a state road, you can't have a sign 
right. every 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 right. six feet because the streetscape uh, report also said there shouldn't be as many signs. And so I think it, we shouldn't have this false choice of either cover the whole city with yellow paint or leave it the way it is. It's, let's find where there are genuine safety concerns and to me look at some of the the idea of the the white lines uh, on the street would be, uh, I think someone mentioned, maybe in a, in a pilot way, that would be the way to do it. And you know, the, the other piece of it is not everybody is entitled to a, a parking space right in front of their house because most streets, including the one I live on, there's only parking on one side of the street. So by definition, that's not something we should entertain. So once you accept that, then the idea is there's going to be some restrictions. I know we've got this parking management study underway, but I think on this thing, if there's safety concerns, we should look at, to me, maybe the painting, the white on the street. And I will stop there. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I have just two points to make. Uh, one is, first of all, I want to say that I agree with uh, Councilmember Qureshi and Councilmember Kovar that uh, there are places in the city where uh, there are safety concerns, and I think we should have the flexibility to uh, address those. Uh, it's not just parking too close to driveways on places like Sherman Avenue where there's a steep hill, but also uh, like on Ritchie Avenue where there's, there's a sharp curve. And if people park there on the curve, it's very difficult mm -hmm. and, and dangerous for cars coming head on into the curve. Um, but you mentioned that the, the, the paint doesn't last very long, and you, you have to reuse it uh, or repaint it uh, a couple times a year? Yeah, well, everything from car tire marks to, to chipping paint to temperature changes, depending on when it was painted, can eliminate the paint. And the thermoplast. A little, uh, it's a little more resistant. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that I really get miffed, and we, we talk about... Um, you know, disparity between different wards, um, people who are active or not active in the community. And for I don't know how many years, I begged for uh, thermoplast to be used for the crosswalks on Maple Avenue, mm -hmm. which has a predominantly pedestrian neighborhood, mm -hmm. many kids going to and from the schools. And yet we weren't able to do that. Uh, we used the house paint or whatever it is that wears off very quickly um, and did that for years, continued to do that for years, and didn't in fact put down the thermoplast uh, crosswalks until we got a, uh, a grant, a community group got a grant uh, to pay for that. And it just uh, really irritates me that uh, at the drop of the hat we're willing to go out there and start putting down thermoplast for uh, you know parking spots in, uh, because we get neighborhoods that uh, uh, have more representation here at the council meetings. Yeah. Well, our use of thermoplast has changed drastically in the last five years. So five years ago, we did not use thermoplast at all because it wasn't available. Um, it was, you had to use a machine with glass beads and it was a very extensive and expensive process. It wasn't something we were able to do. But the manufacturer of thermoplastic has changed, so now you can get heat down applications. So five years ago, we stopped doing uh, paint applications and, and uh, things like speed hump markings, crosswalk markings, and we've been shifting over to thermoplast. So now we buy quite a few um, pallets of thermoplastic strips and are using them uh, for crosswalk markings. So uh, it was, it part was of much what more you, recently than five years ago that, uh, that the crosswalks were put in the thermoplast in Ward 4. Yeah. We can, I can go through that history. Uh, there was a number of issues that affected the timeline of that, but I appreciate what you're saying. We, we did change uh, practice in the department from using paint to using thermoplastic as the technology changed. So in uh, summary, I would support uh, doing this in a spot basis for uh, mm -hmm. dangerous uh, situations, but not across the board. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilmember Schultz. Where I want this to uh, end up is that, that nobody in the city should be told when they ask for help that we don't do yellow paint in the city, <laughs> okay? I mean, I, I just don't think that, that that's, that's uh, a proper approach to re responding to our residents. 
I'm not saying that because of you, I realized this was something that we decided to do. But I think it was a mistake. Uh, okay. Um, I keep thinking that we're, we're making a mountain out of a molehill here. Is it, my, my feeling is, as, as one of my constituents, Casey Brennan, said, only in Tacoma Park can folks get upset enough about painted curbs to demand action by elected officials talk about first world problems. And so I, I uh, appreciate your, your comments here because you almost have to have the wisdom of Solomon to, to keep things, help us figure this thing out. But y yellow paint is just is almost universal from across the United States in terms of marking areas that, that are prohibited to do something on the cur along the curb. Um, in fact, I was driving through Chevy Chase, one of those really, really lovely little neighborhoods over by Bradley Lane. They got yellow paint on all the curbs over there, and I, I, don't, I don't see anybody having problems. I didn't see anybody lying on the street, dying. Of, I mean, it's not like we're talking about some things that are, and I'm being a little sarcastic here, uh, that are, you know, cause allergies or, or, or um, affect cl cl climate change. Um, I just think that there are certain areas where people, if they have driveways and they need to keep cars out, there's nothing wrong with letting those, for, for applying yellow paint. And to be able to say, oh, well, this is a policy, just doesn't seem reasonable to me. I asked a question on my list serves yesterday about how people feel about that, and I got somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 responses. Not a single one of them was supportive of the idea of banning yellow paint. Everybody says, let's, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, or other people have said, yes, absolutely, we, we, we need it. Uh, and, and I, I can't, I, and I happen to actually agree with that point of view. So I, I realize maintenance, you have to do the repainting, but you have to do repainting on stop lines and, and other things as well. And I think that the alter one of the alternatives, if we don't do this, is put up metal signs saying no parking from here to there. Uh, and next thing, and I, all I notice is a blight, just a, a plethora of metal signs up and down our, our streets. And I, I don't understand why yellow paint seems to be the villain here, and lots of metal signs doesn't seem to be the villain here. Because you have, in some places, you have to drill holes in the sidewalk to put them in. That's not a good idea. And if, if there's grass there, somebody's got to work, mow around them and all that. So that's an inconvenience. If you park your car next to it, you can't open the door. Yellow paint, you don't have any of those problems. And nobody seems to sort of see, see that point of view. We, on Wildwood Drive, where we have had circles installed, which work, what happens is, is that people park too close to that intersection and, and, and all of a sudden the circle's not functioning right. And, and, and I know uh, some advocates for the yellow, for the uh, uh, prohibition of painting have said, well, we need to educate people. And once they understand, but the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people are just thoughtless, or, or, or you know, or worse, and they sort of figure I'm going to park here anyway because I'm going to gamble that the police aren't going to give me a ticket, and they do, because parking is always an, an issue, and it's been the point has been made. Oh, if you have yellow paint and signs, sometimes there's discontinuity between them. I think that's a problem that that can be addressed, but yellow paint is visible except maybe in snowstorms and, and uh, when we have leaf collections. But for the rest of the time, it's quite visible. White lines, thermoplastic, it, maybe that would work. I, I mean, who, I, I'm not smart enough to be able to say, oh, we shouldn't do that. But I just don't think we ought to take yellow paint off the, uh, off the table as, a, uh, as an option. Uh, particularly for the the individuals who have driveways. 
I mean, if, when, if you're blocked in, I mean, you've, it, isn't it amazing how such a little thing as painting on a curb gets people so fired up? It's just, it, it, we can talk about big things and hardly anybody shows up, but when it comes to something as simple as this, people, I mean, I've never gotten so many emails on anything <laughs> in eight years. And so that's my statement. I'm, I'm in favor of trying to use with yellow paint, use it with discretion. If there's a better way of solving the problem, that's fine, but let's not take it off, eliminate it. If I might, um, I heard a couple um, suggestions um, that kind of identify where some safety issues um, might apply. There's narrow streets, there's steep hills, there's um, very busy streets. Um, <coughs> Why don't I come back with some suggestions that would kind of give some, maybe some criteria for when a street could be considered and, you know, then it could be a little bit of up to the street if it were the painting on the street or the yellow curbs. Mm -hmm. And let's bring it back and just see if it, if it seems to make some sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't... I, I'd, I'd like to at least have some criteria down for something like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that would, I think right now, as I said before, when we started this conversation, people are in limbo and, you know, mm -hmm. it is it is really confusing um, and adds to the frustration. So, um, you know, as we were talking, I was looking up, I, I think the idea of, I haven't seen another area that uses the white lines, but um, I think that would be an interesting thing to try maybe starting on Sherman <laughs> Avenue, see if it could address that issue so uh, sooner. Yeah, I was starting. Um, but well, I was going to suggest if uh, just from the folks who are here tonight, if we wanted to offer that as a pilot, just to try it on a street and have the residents themselves say seemed to work or didn't do anything or yeah, we yeah. just do with paint. And mm -hmm. they'll go. Can, uh, can, okay. Could we try different like in the historic district, and I'm not trying to be nasty here. I mean, you know, try a different color paint. No, for, I, mean, I yeah. There's actually there are some standards about about paint color uh, for f that indicate when it's a. Oh, okay. There's the, there the, there are I, there are some. Strike that of, from the record. <laughs> no, no, it's just a lot easier for us to adhere to kind of the state standards on colors. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think this is a good discussion, and it'll come back. And um, I think we the other item that Councilmember Schultz had requested was um, sometime in the future talking about the speed humps. Right. And before we do that, Ms. Braithway is going to uh, send us a memo, right. just kind of making sure that. we all understand what our current policy is, and then yeah, we, we'll come back to that. We'll get back. We'll get that right. to you. And, and you may not know this off the top of your head tonight because it's late, but when are we coming back to the parking study? You know, I'm not sure. Okay. They're waiting till the new planner okay. gets gets on board, right. and and he's not till another couple of weeks. So okay. it's it's gotten delayed. The person's mm -hmm. been hired. Though. We we have we have hired a wonderful staff person, but he's not on board yet. Great. All right. Terrific. All right. Our last item for this evening um, is an overview of city boards, commissions, and committees. Um, I'll say that I I had requested that uh, the city clerk kind of pulled together for us um, the different uh, boards, commissions, and committees uh, so that we were able to review these. As my colleagues know, this year um, was the first time we had a uh, joint meeting with our with the Tree Commission. Um, we do one with the Committee on the Environment, and this year we had one with the Tree Commission. And I think um, from my perspective and from what I've, the feedback I've gotten from the Tree Commission participants, they thought it was very useful. Um, moving forward, and I know um, Committee on the Environment uh, has also found our joint meetings useful in terms of uh, setting priorities and getting clarity of uh, what the council priorities are. Um, so I thought we would kind of look at what are the other um, committees and that we have in the city, think about, um, you know, are there things that we are missing? Are there committees you didn't know about and now? <laughs> know about um are there questions you have um 
And um, another question is that um, some of our committees do have um, staff who are sort of assigned to them and participate, and others don't. Um, and so those were just some of the questions I wanted to uh, kind of throw out there. I don't know if any uh, Councilmember Smith would like to start us off. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you bringing this before us. How does staff decide when you assign someone to a committee? Other than Colta, because I understand why you need yeah. an attorney there, but the other committees, how do you make that decision? Oh, sorry, you got and myself off. Right. Um, sometimes there may be just a person with expertise on the subject area, um, committee on the environment, has somebody from public works, so that kind of thing. Um, sometimes it's who drew the short straw. <laughs> Um, sometimes it's kind of who the committee wants, and sometimes committees don't want staff there, which is, to me, is a, it, off, somewhat a little bit problematic um, because then sometimes the information that staff may have to be able to share, we don't even know that, that that's a topic of conversation and could have just been answered or, or that we could get some assistance. But um, I think, you know, Staff has mixed feelings about staffing these committees because they're usually at night. So, you know, depending on which area it is, you might have a number of committees that you have to staff. And do we compensate staff if they go to these committees after hours? If it's so, if they are eligible for overtime, yeah. Okay. For for many of the staff members, there it's it's just another thing we do. And how do the committees handle the Open Meetings Act? They followed them. So, mm -hmm. so we, we give them... They're the to be trained and okay. um, and their notes published, the, the meetings advertised, they have to be in a place that's accessible, and then minutes need to be posted. And are they audited on occasion by staff to make sure that they're following everything? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we pay a lot of attention. Okay. I mean... Oh, now you just turned it off. Okay. This isn't bad as the old days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, you're, you're on. Okay. okay, you're good. Je uh, Jesse has a whip. We, no, we pay a lot of attention, okay. but improvement, you know, in fact, I have a, a an email uh, drafted to send out to committees to remind them. this The new requirement of posting agendas 20 more, at least 24 mm -hmm. hours in advance of a meeting, that's been a particular problem because well, it's just been a problem. It, sometimes things come together for some of the committees at the last minute, mm -hmm. and and it's a, there's a learning curve with all of this. Definitely. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Siemens. I just want to say I've read through the list and I uh, support keeping all of the committees that are in these documents. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add any? Um, uh, I'll wait till I hear what other okay. suggestions are made. Kate? Councilmember, yeah. You went. Councilmember Cobra? Just a few questions. I wondered if these ideas had been considered in the past. So, one thing people sometimes ask me about is um, term limits or staggered terms. And is that something that we've considered? I know sometimes people have served for a long time, which is not necessarily bad. Uh, I'm against term limits for elected officials, so I'm not <laughs> per se in favor of them for this, but just wondering if that's ever come up. Uh, some do have term limits. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of them do, but, but a number don't. Uh, and uh, staggered terms, I mean, all the terms are staggered. Oh, okay, well, so that's not really an issue. Yeah. But, I mean, what led to some having term limits and some not, do you think? When the council set, set them up. Uh, some were set up with right. term limits and some without. And I know that recently you've had a, a few more questions aimed at eliciting um, the idea of greater diversity in the mm -hmm. committee membership. And I don't know if it's too soon to know whether that's making a difference or? It only makes a difference in what you know beforehand. It really doesn't, it doesn't make any difference in who we right. get mm -hmm. applying. The truth of the matter is, it's about where we're recruiting, and I think is is part of the issue that the way we recruit isn't reaching 
some of the people that we want to meet. So I guess the question is, would it be better to change the re recruitment or to actually specify some uh, diversity requirements? Some, some of the committees do have, you know, there may be something even expressed about being from different wards. Um, I mean, that, that's geographical, right? I mean, I think right. that would, to me, that would make sense for almost every committee, but I, I guess I'm talking about, you know, ethnic and racial as well. I mean, okay. do you, if we don't think that's happening enough, should we try to do better there? Since most of the applicants are kind of rustled up by you all, I mean, uh -huh. Some of it comes from who, who you encourage to apply. Okay. Um, but it certainly is up to you if you want to put some criteria to the selection. Yeah. Two, other, two other quick questions. Um, I noticed in some of them there are general criteria for membership. It said some people should have this background or that background. Mm -hmm. But when the openings come up, we never are told, well, this is for the slot that's held by someone with a professional background, or this is held for. Is that? Yeah, the, the, um, I think you are. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. with the, for instance, the Committee on the yeah. Environment, we, ha I, we haven't been identifying well uh, in the, I don't think, um, we haven't been identifying, for instance, business, people involved with business. I think that's maybe something lacking on that committee. Uh, but generally, I think uh, the Facade Advisory Board has a particular mm -hmm. uh, but people that need to be on it. Colta is another one. Uh, we need some landlords, mm -hmm. some tenants. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Yeah, there, I was looking at the facade advisory board. In yeah, particular. a number of them. Yeah. Um, some of those are just guidelines for what the background should that's be. That's right. Okay. Some of them are really okay. guidelines. One I mean, last the question. The board's very specific. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. yeah. very One specific. last question on reports to council because sometimes, I mean, I think the joint meetings have been great, mm -hmm. but we don't know, well, I shouldn't say we, I don't always know what they're up to. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way that everyone I've seen has the very committed, dedicated people. But is there, or should we get annual reports or is that just another task and then we wouldn't have time to go through it? or? I don't know what's been the past. I mean, history. I think one of the things I was going to, as I was going through it, um, you know, many times in the past we've had um, the com committees or commissions come and report. We're due for one from the Arts and Humanities Commission. Um, uh, we've we've had the Board of Elections come mm -hmm. numerous times, and they you always come before and yeah. after elections. Um, we haven't the Commemoration Commission. I think it was here last year as they were finalizing mm -hmm. things. Um, we always, Colta, I'm not sure we necessarily no, need to see be, them. Right. Committee on the Environment, we have the joint meeting. Um, Council of Compensation Committees, only when um, it needs to be there. We see the emergency preparedness folks at least twice a year. Um, ethics, again, is like an ad hoc when they yeah. need it. Um, the one, I guess, when I go through it, we see the Grants Review Committee. We just saw the no nuclear free one, um, was more the Recreation Committee. Um, and I was going to propose that maybe we do a joint meeting uh, with the Recreations right. Committee because uh, I think we would benefit from that. Around budget. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, we do have the Safe Roadways Committee usually comes before council at least once or twice a year. Um, that's one that I actually have a, a question on if, when Council Member Colvar is done. Are you done? Um, so if we're there, um, my question on that one is um, whether or not it would be beneficial to relook at um, a st having a staff person involved in that committee. It's which an, one? Um, Safe Roadways. Oh. It's as needed, and as I've talked to different people <coughs> on that committee, um, I've heard different things. So I, I, I wasn't here when that committee was established. Um, and so, um, but I think it might be beneficial. Um, yeah. So. They have, um, it's true, uh, there's some history there for why they don't have a staff person, um, and I think it was set up purposefully to be as needed, and I, however, they have gotten assistance from, right. uh, especially housing and community development yeah. when needed, and I think they've met with, they've called people in mm -hmm. from time to time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, yes. Many people to come mm -hmm. assist. But and before they come, maybe come in and do their report. If um, we could get like maybe a recommendation from staff on whether or not okay. 
that would make sense um, to have uh, a committee member. I, I'm just I'm also thinking of, of how the committee on the environment um, I think works very well. Um, mm -hmm. The council's informed of what they're doing. We go back and forth on priorities. Um, they also know what the staff is doing, and I think part of that is because Gina Mathias is mm -hmm. an active mm -hmm. participant there. So, yep. um, and then the only the other question I wanted to raise um, was I know we have um, the chief has his advisory board, um, but in light of conversations we've had over the last couple of years, I wanted mm -hmm. to. Um, put out there the idea of actually having a police community relations committee mm -hmm. that is one that is um, you know a council appointed committee like our others um, and um, again we can work we don't have to work through the details tonight it's 10 o'clock but um, we could take that up at another time um, and figure out you know okay. what the goal of that would be and the different tasks but for me looking across I agree with council member Siemens I don't I don't think we need to get rid of any of our committees, um, but that seems to be um, a hole at the moment. So, One mm. thing that um, I see in other communities that is done often on an annual basis is um, an informal get together with the members of the committees and the council members um, as, as kind of a thank you to the people for participating, mm -hmm. but it's also a nice informal way to um, connect with members and so you'd have you know the personnel com board or you know some of the folks that you don't folks from Colta that you're not going to see yeah. on a regular basis but it's an opportunity to thank them but it's and it's also an opportunity sometimes to share an issue or two that you might not otherwise find out about so you know that's just I think these joint meetings that you've had have been particularly useful um, much more useful than coming up before the council at the dais and giving an annual yeah. report. Um, but also an opportunity for that informal interaction sometimes is nice too, so mm -hmm. just an idea. Cool. Great. Um, let's see. Oh, I've gotten behind. Okay. Uh, council Member Schultz. Yeah, I, um, I would first off say that I really like the fact that no two committees in the city, or using that as an overall rubric, are alike. Each one <laughs> seems to be structured a little differently, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, and for good reason, mm -hmm. because the subject matter is different for each one, and um, and they, for the most part, I, I I think that the committees in my time seem to have gotten become more effective. I don't, that's just an opinion on my part. So I think what we're doing is great. I, I would agree that all the ones we have are, are uh, purposeful and we need to keep them. A uh, couple, couple thoughts. I, um, I cut my teeth as a city, as an activist in the city when I joined the Citizens, Public Safety Citizens Advisory Committee probably around 2004 because uh, I figured that was a committee, the police safety was the thing I knew the least about. And so I thought, well, this will be the most fun and interesting. Uh, and that was uh, a predecessor <coughs> to the police chief's advisory board. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember at one of those meetings, council member Bruce Williams came to sit into the meeting. And I was so impressed and so excited to think, my gosh, a council member is here. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, I don't know, I mean, because this, this was all new to me. And this is the first committee and I've been involved with in any way, shape, or form. And I'd never even met uh, Bruce Williams. I just knew that he was somebody important because he was on the city council. So I think that, and I know we've talked about the relationship between us members on the council and these committees. Mm -hmm. So I would want to recommend that, not as a policy, but that we just maybe try from time to time to, with permission of the chairperson, visit one, participate in one of these committee meetings, whether 
I don't think it needs to be organized. We don't need assignments or anything like that. But just to show show up and and uh, if with invitation, uh, not to surprise anybody, because I think it would just be a morale boost to think for for some of those members, because a lot of the members on these committees, this is their only exposure that they're ever going to have in terms of getting involved in, in city business. In terms of um, um, committee uh, actual committees, I've, I've, I do think that I would agree with uh, uh, Mayor Stewart that with regard to the police advisory committee that is appointed and staffed by the police chief, I, I have just I've have a, several people in my ward who've served on that and still do. Um, and uh, but not with a great deal of satisfaction, mm -hmm. a certain amount of frustration, partly the way they're run, but partly because there's so many absences that people not showing up, and then partly because sometimes the meetings get called off because the chief is, is you know, just can't be there yeah. all the time, which is understandable. So I think a, 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 a committee that mm -hmm. is a standing committee with regard to the police is really, really important. I mean, for obvious reasons. <coughs> world's, what's going on in our in our country these days, if for no other reason. Uh, I, I would think we'd want to, want, I do wonder whether the Tree Commission needs to have more than five people on it to the extent that Tree Commission members think that it's a mandate needs to be broadened, and it, it has broad. They have broadened it themselves in recent years because of the the pe people on that committee have have tried to do more things than just do the reviews of the uh, arborists' decisions. Um, and there's two two new ones that I would think I'd like us to think about. One is one I've mentioned before, is a fiscal advisory committee which because this would be a committee that would work uh, and become familiar with the city's budget revenues uh, and, and that sort of thing because it's the budgeting is the most important thing that the city council does and it takes up an enormous amount of our time it is the the hardest thing for, as a new as a council member to figure out what you're doing when you're dealing with the budget and it is the, the, most, the most difficult thing for residents to comprehend uh, when we're talking about all the, all the moving parts in, in a budget. And I think a fiscal advisory board or committee could act as kind of a small committee of people who are really interested and in, inter, intrigued and want to get involved with understanding municipal budgeting and how we do it. Uh, and then they can act as, as a bridge between the city council and the Department of Finance, you know, the staff, yourself, and the rest of the city, because a lot of times we're here trying to explain things to our constituents about the budget. We're here trying to get residents to under, pay attention to what we're doing. But I, I sometimes thought that if we, we could use some help in that way, not to interfere in the decision making, but simply to be a sort of is, is a liaison to help help uh, with communications and understanding and education. And the other one is my my pet area is economic development, mm -hmm. of course. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be neat once we get going on all three, four, five, six cylinders? I don't know how many we're going to get going here in the coming years to have an economic development. Uh, panel, I won't call it a commission or a committee or anything like that. That is really just be interested in focusing on the the, the the subject of economic development in the commercial districts. That can help bring the the OTPA and the CDA into one room for a few hours every month, and and bring residents to the table and small business pe people because there is no form for small business people in the city. 
much other than the uh, OTBA and the, and the CDA, but um, just be, because I think it's going to become far more important as the Purple Line develops, comes along, and other things happen. Uh, it's not an urgent, but it's just something I put out there because I think it, I'd like us to, uh, to, 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 to think about it. That's all. Thank you. Councilmember Koreshi. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with Councilmember Schultz. I cut my teeth on a committee with uh, people in the audience as a member of the Board of Elections, and that's one of the reasons I got interested in city politics, and that's one of the reasons why I ran. So I think we owe a debt to the people who serve on our committees because they're a big help to us, and for that reason, I would fully support a thank you event mm -hmm. where we can get together with all of them in an informal setting. I think that would be great. Um, I joined the mayor in, um, in a police community relations committee. I think it's long overdue. I think it addresses issues far outside the ambit of what I think the chief's committee does. Um, it really is community input on how to effectively police and to address concerns and how to improve our police department. Now, the committees that we do have, Arts and Humanities, Community on the Environment, Tree Commission, Safe Roadways, to me, I think our committees charged with carrying on the character and values of Tacoma Park and advising the council in, with respect to that. Um, and I think given the current climate within our neighborhood or our, our city, um, the only way we're going to carry on those values is if, are if people can afford to live here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think especially given the fact that we have a revolving fund in place, at least currently, to have a group of community members who can form an affordable housing committee to address a number of issues. I know Colta deals with a lot of landlord tenant and sort of rent issues, but single family homes. I think this also falls under the ambit of what Councilmember Schultz <clears throat> brought up a few months ago, which is the blighted and abandoned properties and using them as part of our affordable housing initiative and how we can address that. Um, so I think that adding an affordable housing committee is something that's long overdue in our community um, and it'll allow us to use experts within our community to address those very important issues, um, which also begs the other question, which is not really on point here, but I would, you know, the revolving fund, for example, you know, what about giving assistance to people who want to come in here and purchase for a single family home a blighted property within our community, um, I think that that would be a big boost in the community. Um, and then finally, what the mayor suggested, having a meeting with the Recreations mm -hmm. Committee, I think it's in line with our other council priority, which is youth success. I think that the Recreation Committee could receive some guidance from us on how we'd like to, them to carry that flag for us too because it's an important priority and they're at the front lines of that issue. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I will say the other idea I did have, I didn't put forward as another committee, um, was one as we were doing this work on equity issues. Um, and the reason I didn't is because the Tacoma Park mobilization um, <coughs> has an equity committee. And I'd like to meet with them and see what they're doing so we don't have too many committees. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, we can have too many. Uh, Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, the one committee that I would like us to consider is a, a youth cabinet. Oh, Since mm -hmm. we are doing yeah. things, so many areas, um, programming, uh, initiatives uh, for young people in the community, and the Council has highlighted that as a priority, it would be nice to elevate uh, some youth in our community. That is um, what's his name? <laughs> Mr. Gehring at the middle school and the Difference Makers uh -huh. are looking into that. Okay. Um, so they have, um, I met with them a few months ago, gave them a whole bunch of background from the National League of Cities. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so, and, and I've actually talked to Councilmember Schultz about this and um, thinking that if it, comes from a group of students that then we could support, sustaining it is probably will be easier rather than us setting something up and okay. kind that's of getting fine. them. But yes, I thank you for reminding me. I, that had, yeah, I'll check in with Mr. Gary right. again and see where that's going. But right. I know a number of students were very excited about that. Uh, Council Member Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> uh, it's good work. I just I know. It is. 
<laughs> too long a pause in between each time. I, I just like to voice support for some of the suggestions that I've heard. The Police Community Relations Committee, I think, is a great idea. Uh, I think uh, we've got some work to do on the details on that uh, to, for us to reach agreement. And I think Councilmember Schultz's suggestion of the Economic Development and the Physical Committee are certainly things that I would be interested to hear more about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you for putting these materials together. I think um, as we move forward on some of these ideas tonight, just even having this chart is really helpful. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much for it. And um, we're adjourned. That's it for us this evening. Yeah.